What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Knighted Ones podcast, episode number 32. We're the only podcast that features a former UCF national champion, a former UCF radio host, an infamous rapper, an IG star, shooting the breeze, talking UCF sports. Uh, Tonight, we are a little bit shorthanded. We have no Roger and no Josh, but we have myself, Mr. Ben Stout, and Trey Neal. So without further ado, let me bring in the guys to the show. There's Mr. Trey Neal, the former national champion. How are you? I'm good, man. Just watching uh, Iowa beat LSU. Oh, yeah. Caitlin Carter. Get right? some revenge on last year. Yeah, man. All right. And then, of course, we have our resident seven-footer, Mr. Ben Stout. How are you? Doing well, guys. Good to see you all. Yeah, we're uh, we're going to hold it down for the rest of the crew tonight. <laughs> yeah, it will probably be a lot shorter of a show, which can be nice sometimes. But, yeah, we'll hold it down for our uh, guys that are absent tonight. Full on off season show right here. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly right. So, well, that's a good transition. Uh, you know, we are in the off season for most of UCF's major sports here. Obviously, basketball. Uh, you know, they are out, lost in the NIT, which we talked about last week. So, let's get into the big news for UCF basketball, which. We kind of alluded to this on the last show, guys, but Johnny Dawkins was extended. Um, Publicly, at least, the terms of his new deal were not really released. Um, We all kind of have surmised it's probably a short deal, maybe adding one, two years to his current one year that he had remaining on his old contract. And we don't know terms of the buyout. We obviously don't know numbers or figures, but Johnny has been extended after a you know, surprise year where UCF, uh, you know, outperformed their initial expectations. So Ben, why don't you get into, you know, are you happy with the move? Obviously we don't have a ton of details, but, you know, I think we thought that this was probably expected. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to actually hearing some of the details. I mean, as, as you said, Alan, we're, we're expecting it. I mean, I, I think we'd all be shocked if it was beyond three years uh, the extension. I think I think it even even a little bit surprised if it was, you know, if it was uh, any more than two years. Um, that's about what I would expect is a two year extension with a relatively um, let's call it normal buyout, if you will. Um, it's interesting because tonight it, um, it was announced that. Uh, out of a fellow league mate, um, Oklahoma State hired Will Lutz, who's the uh, coach of Western Kentucky this uh, this past season, took them to the um, NCAA tournament. It took a few other schools prior to Western Kentucky to the NCAA tournament. And so I'm while I'm happy to no longer be a part of a uh, stepping stone school, if you will. I mean, obviously, if you're able to, you're able to be a coach at at UCF um, at any program, but certainly either football or basketball at this point with the with their standing our standing in the Big Twelve, it's uh, no longer a stepping stone job, which is which is great for us. Um, but what that means is, and we talked about this a little bit last week, is that when you're when you're going after coaches um, that are maybe hot commodities, um, coaches that are taking smaller schools to the NCAA tournament. Um, Those smaller schools, very similar to what we have done in the past with buyouts of Josh Heupel, buyouts of Coach Frost. I mean, you've got to pay some money in order to get them out of their contract um, at that university. And so the reason why I brought up Will Lutz is the, his new contract at Oklahoma State hasn't been announced, but I know that his buyout at, at a Western Kentucky was $2 million. Uh, that's more than Johnny Dawkins makes in a, in a year. Um, wow. And so uh, and so it just it just kind of goes to show you that, like, you know, if we were able or, you know, it's as you mentioned, Alan, you know, Johnny Dawkins, his team, uh, you know, overperformed from expectations, I guess, of the outsiders looking in. As we got into the season, expectations start to rise as the team plays well. And ultimately, with the amount of close losses that we had, um, you could say that they, you know, they probably wound up about where they um, they should have been with the with the talent and the and the grit that this team had. So, I mean, it's it's a good overall year for 
Johnny Dawkins our first year in the Big 12, but a little bit of that had to do with um, some limited expectations of his squad in, a, in the toughest conference in college basketball. But that being said, I, I think that's that's certainly enough to um, – to extend him and make sure that, you know, uh, he's not a lame duck coach going into his last year of his contract. Um, but I don't know if it was enough to extend him beyond a, a you know, a long term period, um, or get the, as we kind of discussed last week, you know, kind of get the, get any type of criticism off of his back. Um, just because of two things, I think <clears throat> look back on this season, I think you look at the amount of games that we were right there and didn't pull it out. Um, you know, it's kind of a what could have been season. And then ultimately, while while the recency bias of this kind of stinks for Johnny Dawkins, it's it's I mean, you just can't it, it's a it's a tough pill to swallow when you lose the last one against that team um, the way that we did against uh, the cows. So um you know it's uh it that that part of it was a little rough and so it, it kind of leaves a bad taste in the mouth on the, on the season and um it, i mean ultimately i think that the the news when it finally does become public um i think uh that news is gonna is gonna come out where um it will probably be about a two-year extension yeah uh, that probably makes the most sense uh trey I know last time we asked this question, it spawned a whole Gus Malzahn conversation, which yeah. we'll get into a little bit later. But uh, any thoughts on on Dawkins getting extended? Yeah, I mean, I guess like because, again, I'm not familiar with the coaching basketball, but you alluded to the guy from Western Kentucky getting hired. Um, what I mean, the buyout's two million. That's more than the salary. Alice, obviously, he's a would he be a hotter commodity upcoming coach, would you say that Oklahoma State got? Than Johnny Dawkins, yeah, probably. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he okay. absolutely would be. I mean, uh, he's 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 kind of like I don't want to r- really equate the two sports, but just to I mean, he's not quite at the at the hot commodity that that Frost was coming out, but he but there's there's usually a handful of coaches in college basketball yeah. that like bring their teams to the tournament a few years in a row. Mm-hmm. And and he's one of those guys, and okay. he's, so he's definitely a hot young name in, in yeah. college basketball right okay. now. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's because that really what I was, I guess what I was saying, I was wanted to ask was what like kind of like last week, well last week, where even though the extension's short, it's obviously not, it's a commitment, but it's not like a marry me commitment if you get what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see how this keep going, keeps going. Um. What would be an, like? What would be an upgrade? Because to me, I think ultimately expectation determine, you know, if you are successful or not. You know, I think everybody has a program. We want to be just compet. I, I don't know about basketball or basketball, but football. There's a standard. I'm sure you have a standard for basketball. I'm sure the guys that played here before there's a standard, a realistic expectation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, what would that be? And do you think Johnny Dawkins is that guy to get us there? I, it's, it's kind of a tough thing because it's like, I know that I'm kind of the resident, like Johnny Dawkins defender on this show and I get that, but like, um, and that's obviously because I I have a good relationship with him and he's a great guy. And, 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 but I, but I also have seen like just how competitive he is, how he coaches his teams. I like Mm -hmm. the way his team for the most part is very, are very disciplined. Um, I, I don't know if he's necessarily gotten the right uh, combination of, of personalities in the past, like with, you know, uh, with certain guys that um, I think have been maybe, uh, I think the the kind of Brandon Mahan, like kind of like not to, well, I guess I'm going to call specific names out, but like the Brandon Mahan, like kind of uh, uh, Darren Green Jr., uh, Darius Perry era, the la- the, you know, those few years where, those guys were our main contributors to um, I think that led a little bit of like a middling era because I don't necessarily think that personality wise, while that like a guy like Darren Green Jr. is just like an extremely hard worker. Like, yeah, I mean, he puts a I, and all, all three of those guys, I'm sure, put a ton of effort into their uh, into their craft. It's uh, they just never really seem to like kind of buy into what 
what what we saw this season, yeah. honestly. Like what we saw this season with this team, like just seemingly not only having like the grit and like having like the fight like down to the last minute, um, you know, of every game. Um, they they might have been less talented than than the team that they're playing against in the Big Twelve, but they certainly like fought it out towards the very end, no matter where they were at on the scoreboard. Yeah. Um, and and honestly, from my perspective, and a lot of the a lot of the alumni's perspective, like um, that I just talked to, and I know like it's the same for you on the football side, Trey. Like, I mean, you guys, I'm sure have some a, you know some group texts and stuff that go on in the same yep. side. Same thing goes on to the UCF basketball side. Um, like I remember from my era in the early 2000s, the guys that played for Kirk Spira and like, like during the like tough years with Donnie Jones, where you like saw talent on the court and you were just like, these guys don't look like they want, like they, they don't look like they have the like want to, they, no, there's no dogs yeah. on the court. You know what I mean? Like they're just, it just like that. I remember specifically those years, like where us basketball alumni like started to get almost vocal on social media, which we would probably never do anymore because it's like way bigger now. But like, yeah. but like, I don't remember a single time where like our group chat on the basketball alumni side is like, man, these guys like have no want to. They just like you know we have no dogs on this court. Like, like because that's what we look at. Exactly. I remember, we, I remember we talked so much, so much on this show, and and even on Nightline when we talked, like you being on the sideline, and you're just like, mm, I, I'm worried about some of the body language, some of the things that are seen on the court, and and I think that there was probably a couple of players on this UCF basketball team that might have like crept into that like bad body language type vibe, or like yeah. they weren't. But they weren't the leaders on this team. They yeah. weren't like that wasn't Shamari Allen. That wasn't Darius Johnson. That wasn't CJ Walker. That wasn't even Jalen Sellers. Yeah. Um, and, and so like the leaders that were on this team had that grit, had that fire, and they were competitive in the best basketball conference in America. And that's what I was looking for mm -hmm. um, out of this season. And so I think they definitely met that expectation. Um, but it's it's difficult because like I feel like if you manage your expectations about the basketball team, you're looking for those types of things as opposed to necessarily like, you know, making the NCAA tournament every single yeah. season. Like it's not easy to do that. Yeah, exactly. um, and uh, it, if you're, if you're looking to that, like you're always feel like you're kind of on the defense when you're, when you bring up the coaching topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's a little bit, in my opinion, it's a little bit easier to, when anything good happens to say, all right, cool, we caught lightning in a bottle, but, but I, I, you know, I, I don't really see much of a future. So you can always say that. And then when anything goes bad, when anything bad happens, it's like, all right, I'm validated. Let's fire him. Let's get him yeah. out of here. And so it's tough. Um, but uh, uh, I mean, it, it, and, and it's very expected that this type, this time of year, is so easy to blame the coaching staff because we're still not like five years into it. We're still not used to, well, I guess it's been four years really, but like five or four or five years into it, like as college basketball, college sports fans, we're still not used to how quickly these players just don't care about any, the word commitment and, and how quickly they, they move on from a program. Yeah. And so this time of year, the transfer portal gives and it takes away. And this this is the time where the NCAA tournament isn't even done, where the the transfer portal is just taking away at this moment. Like yeah. there's there's only a few players that have been, that are big names in the transfer portal that have actually said, I'm going to this school. Um, and so and so they're still just entering right now. They're entering yeah. As reportedly going through their recruitment process, and so this at this point, if you you're only looking at like minuses from as far as personnel goes on our as far as players on our basketball roster, and you're not seeing any of the pluses yet, and um, and so that that's a it, it, that's a tough time as well. It's also a tough time 
to announce your coach is getting extended when yeah. you know, criticism exists. And, and, and I, and again, I understand I'm, I'm more of a defending of, of, of Johnny Dawkins, but, uh, but I, I also realize and, and acknowledge that some of that criticism is, is very much valid. Yeah. And I think like you're alluding to the, the transfer portal. I think that's every sport, the major right. sport. Like football, that's what it's going to be. I don't know about baseball. Like, I don't know too much about that. But the transfer portal opened up, I mean, the floodgates. Like, it's there's no really commitment. It's a, almost a trial-by-trial trial basis, year-by-year year basis for everything um, and everybody. Um, you know, it, it's hard to see guys follow through with their commitments. And, and I kind of get it now because, again, with the money, um, you know, people are, you know, hey, if you can't play, if you can play here and then you can go jump, Football wise, go play to Alabama, go play to Texas, go play to a Washington. Kids are gonna jump at that plus money. Like it's hard to turn it down. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's similar questions, you know, that you feel about basketball is you know how we feel about football. We don't necessarily, I think, just as former players, because we know what it took to get to where we wanted it. We know the everyday thing. You know, you know, if you're a dog on the court. Most likely you're a dog in the weight room. You're a dog yeah. on practice. You know, you're a dog everywhere. That's not something you just kind of really turn on or off. That's what we want it from football. There's a – listen, we don't care what well, we care about winning, but there's a way to win and there's a way to lose. You know, that that's the thing. Um, and we don't want you guys losing being soft. We don't want to see you guys losing, right. you know, just giving up, quitting, no energy. That's That's what we, as at least as former players, that's what I look for. You know, if you guys are losing and you guys are, you know, you're out there just you're just getting beat. That's completely fine. But when you quit, when you give up all that, that's the thing. So, I, and again, I think I think this year's basketball team is what that's what you're kind of alluding to is they had that grit. They had the dogs. They might not have been the most talented team. And I think that's where you kind of have to work on after that. I think that's the foundation you want. Mm -hmm. that's how we tried to leave it when I was there. Listen, we might, we were all two star, three star guys. You know, we, we know we're getting these four star guys. We know we're starting to get more guys in, but this is how you do it. It doesn't matter about ratings anymore. You're in college. Like these are grown men you're playing against. These are due to care. You want it. Like there's a way to do it. And I think that's, you know, even just losing the football, that's what we feel like is missing from our program. Not necessarily the talent. Cause we, I mean, we talk about the recruiting rankings and rivals and 24 – like, we talk about it all the time. Like, oh, my gosh, this is the most talented, you know, recruiting in UCF history. I feel like we hear that every year now. Um, but I, I think, like you said, it's it's a style you want to see the program of the guys that are in it. Overall, you know, everybody's not going to fall in line. Even our 2017 team, we still had guys that, you know, didn't want to fall in line. But when the majority does – it oversees that, you know, it, it kind of covers that. Um, but yeah, I think if, if that's what, you know, as a former basketball player alumni, if you guys want that gritty, that tough team, this should be what we want, you know, and hopefully the talent part happens, you know, you're in Orlando, you're in a hotbed of Florida, you know, that's yeah. why that comes in. So I don't know. I think it's, that's why I mentioned the whole Gus Malzahn thing. Cause I think it's a, a predicament that we're both dealing with. Um, I, I don't think people see yeah. it yet with football um but I, I think eventually we're gonna come to have these conversations barring success um, yeah i, I want to hear i want to hear alan's yeah. thoughts on this but real quick i i it's uh just to give you an example like it's really easy to like kind of look at the aggregate and say we had these long runs in these game in these games offensively where we just couldn't score or just the the ball just wasn't going in the bucket and like and that on its face and like kind of like from a higher level view is a problem like and it has been a problem like our teams haven't performed to their capability, I think, offensively. And that's something that like Johnny Dawkins needs to continually recruit to, but also address in the way that his game plans are now, again, getting into the details a little bit, but like kind of going back to the this conversation that we're having about toughness and about you know uh, everyone knowing their role and like you know playing with grit like what i saw less of this season 
than I have in the in last year and the year prior and 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 certainly two or three years back on that is when we would get into an offensive lull we didn't resort to one-on-one -on -one basketball as quickly as what we you know had in the past what happened if we missed two or three shots in a row we were in a little bit of a slump offensively like we would just resort right. to like zero team ball like the game plan is completely thrown out the window yeah. and like we're just gonna now try to get ours right yeah. like and that you never i i didn't you saw it at some points uh, certainly like uh, you know there were certain games where you did see a little bit of that but like but like on the whole, like this season, that team, this team stuck together when yeah. they struggled and they played together and they tried to make, have good ball movement still and try to make good cuts and, and still like stuck together. Yeah. But, th but at the same time, they recognize when somebody, you know, could bring them out or maybe carry their team on their back, like Darius Johnson did a few times this season. And then they rode that hot hand. That's fine. But like, it wasn't as forced as it has been in the past. And, and like, again, just looking at a little bit of details, that's like, that's like a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And if we can get like, you know, further, longer stretches than that, um, then, then certainly, uh, you know, that, that bodes well for the future when you combine that with the like, sometimes like stellar defensive game plan that yeah. Johnny Dawkins teams definitely bring um and then the and then last thing i'll say as a criticism that i definitely would 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 put on johnny dawkins as a whole is i think that we need to see some a little bit better in-game adjustments on the offensive end in particular um and i don't again i mean it's it's obvious in games like iowa state where we were still shooting threes and they were just like hey they're daring us to shoot threes because because yeah. they were just letting us do it and we were just continually doing it but like um and, and maybe half of that might have been just on the players just trying to do that and settling for those shots but by the same token like those types of offensive game in-game adjustments need to be stepped up uh, in the coming seasons. And that comes from his assistant coaches, but, but the buck stops at, at Johnny Dawkins. Like that's gotta, ha that's gotta be improved upon for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as it pertains to Johnny Dawkins, I mean, I, my opinion hasn't changed much from what I said. I mean, he, you know, obviously UCF was in a position where they pretty much had to offer him an extension. There was like, we talked about last week, there wasn't really any other options there is an up and coming guy that we can afford, you know, they're all going to demand more than Johnny Dawkins makes now. So um, if it is indeed a short extension, like we all expect, I think it was the right move on all sides and probably even Johnny Dawkins uh, side, because maybe he bets on himself and he continues to outperform expectations. Then he ends up getting a longer term, better term deal, which look, I, I like we've all said a million times, he's a great guy. And I think we all like him and he's had his moments. Um, that being said, I've said that I don't think he's the guy, but from what I said the very first time we ever had a basketball discussion on the show back months ago um, about Dawkins is that he's dealing with limited resources. And I think every single coach would have the same issues at UCF. Like that's why I always yeah. say I don't have high expectations ever. Like for, for me yeah. next year, like I still think we could easily be a bottom five, bottom six team. And I wouldn't even put that on Dawkins, but that also being said, I, that doesn't mean I think we should just forever stand by and just always hire, you know, keep him on the, keep him as a coach just because, yeah. you know, we'd have limited resources at some point you have to kind of cut him loose if it's the same results over and over. But I think any coach that comes in here is going to have an extreme challenge unless they dedicate more, which you'd think with being in the big 12 and, you know, the, the money that will be coming in eventually once we're a full, you know, member financially wise um, that, someone will have more success and, and maybe that can be Johnny as we see some of these recruits he's getting and um, as more time goes on, but it's just hard for me to envision like unless UCF matched the effort they put into football and to basketball, us being like a consistent, like top even five team in the big 12, mainly because it's the, the big 12 and it's already the most difficult conference. Yeah. But when you match that with, you know, underwhelming resources, I don't see a path for us ever being that way unless we just, 
completely have that like grit type team that just always is outperforming expectations and plays, you know, better as a collection of, you know, talent than, you know, having a bunch of star guys. But those seasons feel more like few far in between where you just kind of really outperform your expectations. I think on an average year, you probably lose to Kansas. You probably lose to some of the better teams. And, um, but I think it was the right move for the time being. And, you know, hopefully continues to have years like he had this year where he's more than we expected. But I think UCF basketball is always going to have a challenge unless they they really say, hey, what we did with the football program over the last decade is what we're going to do for the basketball program. Yeah. And then I think everything will elevate from there. But yeah, look, I, I'm not not a fan of this extension. I think it had to happen. But I just I just at the same time, I still have the belief that I think he's Dawkins has hit somewhat of his peak there, here. And I don't see it being you know, much better. Maybe there's a, uh, you know, a tournament appearance here and there, but I don't see it being anything like super consistent. Um, basically just how it's always been maybe once every 10 years, eight years, seven years, maybe gets a little bit better. So, um, but yeah, I mean, good, good, good for Johnny. And I, I like him and let's see how he does next year. Yeah. And that, that, uh, that resources constraint is definitely felt throughout the program i mean i I, recently i've talked with people that are are you know ad level and um and uh associate ad's at ucf and and obviously the basketball program themselves but like it's like it's (laughs) hey it's always like scrape it oh it always has been like for the last i mean forever really but but certainly now it's like, you know, they they just understand how to scrape pennies together to try to like get to get everything out of we that we can. And but yes, that horizon that like, you know, when we're full members of the Big 12, like there is a little bit of a like, OK, what 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 could be possible then? You know what I mean? Like what right. could be possible then? Um, and so that. uh you know that is that is a real you know felt constraint throughout the the basketball program but but throughout a lot of sports i mean not i mean football included uh for that matter uh but certainly um through it, it is felt throughout the basketball program and it's just like hey man we've we've been knocking on you know i mean let's they, they're not saying knocking on the door i'm just trying to think of a phrase to say right now but like you know, we're, we feel like we, we could really bust through once the resources come, but we've got to be able to put two or three more years together of just, you know, the way we've always been as far as um, uh, not the way we've always been, maybe, you know, record wise or whatever you can say, but like, you know, just how we've always just tried to pinch our pennies and, and try to make it work from a resources yeah. standpoint. Um and so that's that's something that could be interesting. And what you're describing, Alan, which is definitely true, is um, is like, you know, eventually is the program, whether the resources are there or not, eventually the pro I think the fan base and the program is just going to want to spark. And they're just not going to feel like that spark is 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 the guy who's been there for almost a decade, right? It's and so like I, I, think that's just, I think that's just what's going to happen eventually. Like eventually, which I'm sure this extension is a couple years. And so like, eventually they're just going to need that spark. Somebody's going to be available that can provide that. Um, I saw today that three of the four uh, men's college basketball coaches that are in the final four, three of the four of those coaches were coaching high school basketball 10 years ago. Wow. Wow. Three of the four coaches were coaching high school basketball 10 years ago. So, so that goes to show you that like there's all of a sudden this pipeline that is forming where, where like you can get young, talented, like inspiring coaches from like lower levels and they can rise quick and make an impact in your program. And I think as that kind of, that potentially continues to develop, you know, I mean, we've got one in our coaching staff right now, and I'm not saying that he's like, you know, should be looked at as our next basketball coach, but we've got a, we've got a number of a couple of the state champion, like, you know, high school basketball coaches on our staff right now. And so like there are, there is opportunities out there. There are, there are avenues to take where you can provide that spark to your program. And, (laughs) 
So, um, like you said, we're uh, we're going to move forward with um, with Johnny, and and we're going to see how how this goes next season. But uh, after that, I think all bets are kind of off. Yeah, I also think too, like with the basketball program, is they need to also like get a few consistent like like higher level winning seasons. Cause like when you look at the footballs, like meteoric rise, like they were compounding 10 win season after 10 win season, like nine wins, even when it wasn't going to the Fiesta bowl. I mean, there was times that 07 and 2010 and, you know, all these times where they were getting nine, 10 wins consistently. And that naturally compounded with just, you know, slightly better recruits more and more the the profile of the program rising and rising, like becoming the, you know, the, favorite in the conference, even though it was conference USA or American, it just was kind of every single year, their profile started to rise. And I think basketball needs that too, to just, they need momentum on all sides to yeah. really have that, you know, just to, to be that team that's going to be more consistent in the conference and, you know, attract better coaches and better recruits. I think there's really no history or foundation of winning. Yes, they've had their moments, but there's, I feel like there's nothing you can really look back to and be like, Hey, that was a special moment outside of course, the, you know, the second round appearance. But when you think of football, you can point to so many special moments that even probably a lot of non UCF fans could, you know, say, all right, I remember that team from this. Whereas UCF basketball, I don't think has that national national appeal or just national recognition, whether it's from fans, media, uh, other coaches, you know, high school players, it's not there. So I think they need like three, four, like, you know, 23 to 25 win seasons, a couple tournament appearances, something to really just get them over the hump. And then I think it'll start to naturally compound a little bit more, but I still find like just that road in the big 12 is going to be so hard to really, I feel like be, you know, maybe consistent, like top five, top seven is something realistic, but to be like a consistent, like we're contending for the conference. I don't even see how that could ever happen just with like, just the amount of blue bloods and yeah. great teams. There. I mean, when you're, t I mean, we looked at it this season, it's like the net rankings and the top 25 rankings. I mean, it's like, if you're saying that you're competing for a top three spot in the big 12, that means you're a top 10 basketball team. That's, in the that's nation. Like yeah. that's it. Like, a, so like, and, I, and I'm not saying that you're saying this, Alan, I'm just saying that like the fans that, that are saying like, oh, well, if we're not top five in the big 12, like that's not good enough. And it's like, well, if you're, top five in the big 12, yeah. you're a top 20 team in the nation. Like that's yeah. basically how it works. If we, if we could be a top 20 team every year, sign me up. Yeah. Everybody would be happy. With that. Yeah, of course. But yeah. and we've talked about it though. And I've used the word opportunity about a billion times uh, during the basketball season. And that's what this, this conference definitely provides, but what that, what that also does is, is you know, yes, it provides the opportunity to beat those teams, but those teams are 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 they aren't quad one, quad two for like for no reason, right? They, I mean, they're 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 very tough matchups, and so you're right, though. I mean, it's uh, there's 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 opportunity to make the NCAA tournament every single season because of the conference that we're in. Um, they the losses don't hurt as bad, um, and the wins are huge, right? Uh, and that's what's really cool. I mean, when you talk about going into a 20, a 20 game conference schedule next season and you're taking away Texas and Oklahoma, but you're adding Arizona, Arizona? you're adding Arizona wow. state, you're adding Utah, which is a perennial, like right on the cusp of the top 25. Like they're, a, they're a very solid basketball team. I mean, you're you're adding a lot of really quality. I mean, even Utah State. Did Colorado make a tournament this year? Too? Yeah, Colorado, Colorado was like a. I mean, they have a. They have the number one. They're probably going to have. Uh, you know, Colorado's probably going to have the number one pick in the NBA draft. I mean, they're like they're that good. Like, and so they had a, 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 a tremendous amount of talent on the basketball team in Colorado. So that's another team. So yeah, we're adding all these teams to the Big 12 now. We're going to add two more conference games. So yes, that all is going to come with that word opportunity, but it's also going to come with a lot of adversity because these teams are good. Yeah. Uh, really good. And um and so that um you know, so so yeah, it's it what you would I think what you're describing or at least what 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 you're describing from my perspective, I guess I should say is what I'm hearing from your from my perspective is is like, I think what we want to see next season, I mean, legitimately next season. And I'm not saying that my goal is that this team, which I, uh, by the way, we're about to get into it. We're about to talk about this, but like, 
we don't know exactly. I mean, who's who? What is this team going to look like next season? We just don't know. And I think that that's going to be the that's the new normal, unfortunately, in college basketball, especially. Um, uh, we're going to have to kind of reload every single year. But um, if we can put together, you know, some more magic in the in the transfer portal, you know, a couple more high school, one or one more high school recruit at least, um, uh, you know, we can have a good solid team next year. I think what I'm looking for out of next season, not to look ahead too quickly, but really what I'm looking for out of next season, I don't want to call them expectations. I just want to, I want the games in late February and early March to matter. And what I mean by that is, is like, I want us like to be right there. Like if we win this game, that might put us over the top to be the last four in or like that, that might put us on the bubble. We're already in the bubble, like mid February. I think obviously better than that would be fantastic. And, and, and that'd be awesome. But like, I, I'd like, and honestly, we kind of experienced that this season. We had a few, yeah, yeah. yeah, a few tough losses, but we had a pathway there at the start of February that we were looking ahead and we were like, okay, well, if we can, you know, if we can pull out this record the rest of the way, then, then who knows what they're talking about come selection Sunday. I think that's, that would be, that would be fun. And that would be something that I think that, UCF fans um, will obviously get behind to the nth degree, but I, I mean, I'm still not going to ever say tournament or bust, and not not at this time. Not not looking forward to the 2024-25 season. Uh, I don't think it's a tournament or bust type thing, um, but uh, but certainly playing meaningful basketball in mid to late February, like yeah. having those games matter for real towards your tournament resume. Um, is something that I uh, I am looking for. Yeah, I think I think that's a reasonable ask too. Again, you're not necessarily like you said saying we have to make the tournament or it's over. Like I think if there's a shot, sign me up because yeah. at the end of the day, that's all we want is just a shot. Like make it applicable, make it a, a, a reason, even if it's the slightest chance you could do it. At least you have a chance. Like don't be like you said. February, Jan- late January, February, and we're like, oh, well, what are we looking for NIT? Are we making yeah. NIT? Like, that's that's not, I don't think, the expectation. Just as where we are as a program now, just in general, I don't think that's the expectation. I think it is, like, you know, reasonable one would be, you know, if we went, like, how we were doing. We are like, if we win these last two games at home and take one on the road, we could, like, there's our shot. Like, that, how we were trying to figure out all these different combinations to get in the tournament. Like, I think that's that's a great expectation, at least for me from – from my perspective, like you said. For sure. Yeah, all right, guys. Well, let's, you know, Ben, you alluded to it with, you know, obviously how much turnover there is every single year, and you're kind of going to be on a rotating, just kind of one-year basis and having to reload almost every single year. And we're seeing that a little bit now this season. Obviously, UCF did keep a lot of their main core guys from this year, but we now have seen four um, scholarship guys enter the portal. And the biggest two names that most UCF fans are obviously fam- familiar with are CJ Walker and Marcellus Avery um, are both in the portal who were, were obviously really big contributors. And I think there was a, a thought that CJ Walker was going to come back. I mean, he once again dealt with injuries again. So I guess he has another year of eligibility just with all the uh, time that he's missed over the past few years, but he kind of really seemed to hit his stride this year consistently for what feels like, at least for me, the first time since he's been here where really, really was someone where like not saying like, what if, you know, what if he didn't get injured? Like he actually was a really big contributor. So uh, Ben, I mean, h- how big are these losses specifically Walker and, and Avery? And then we also saw Langford transfer and um, I, I'm not sure on the pronunciations at Mubar. Is that how you pronounce it? Sorry. Yeah, Kome Amobor. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I'll start with Kome. Just, I mean, he was a freshman this season. Um, highly touted, rec- or, well, relatively highly touted recruit out of um, North Carolina. He was a, a very good high school player. Um, and with some of the losses that we had in our recruiting cycle going into this season, uh, kind of the late. NLI releases uh, that we had going into this past season. Um, he was kind of our main, you know, freshman 
incoming. Um, it actually, the other freshman, Nils Mahoski, um, wound up playing much more significant minutes and playing much better. Uh, he was more of a garbage time player. So that uh, I'll just quit, I'll say, you know, Kome Amobor um, just is one of those guys that uh, UCF fans are just never going to get to know. I mean, he, he decided that uh, because of the lack of playing time this year, he's going to go try to seek another program that will give him that. And uh, I wish him the best. But, you know, who knows what he could have been uh, with UCF. Uh, you, you, you're right uh, in saying that C.J. Walker – and Marcellus Avery um, are certainly the biggest losses. Now, I will say that I, I didn't necessarily – I mean, he walked on senior night. I, I kind of didn't expect C.J. Walker to come back. I just didn't know – I didn't think he was necessarily going to transfer. I was going to maybe think that he was going to take his shot at going overseas or maybe play in the G League or something, you know, see seeing what he can do in the NBA draft. Uh, not that I thought he was going to get drafted by any means, but um, but maybe one of those guys that could, you know, make a roster eventually. Um, and so I kind of was prepared mentally to lose him anyways, um, but I was a little surprised to see him actually go in the transfer portal and see what what's happening there. And, and one of the main reasons why I was surprised at that is because it was kind of like, as you said, Alan, it was kind of like, a, you know, he never was able to re to reach his full potential here. He was our first player that first uh, first player to ever you know step foot on the court in a UCF uniform that was formerly a five star recruit. I mean, he was a top twenty national recruit um, coming out of uh, I believe Oak Ridge High School in in Orlando. Here, um, he's a guy that's from Sanford. Um, he went to Oregon initially out of high school and he was a five-star recruit. And, and he was one of those guys that if you look back in 2019, um, maybe it was 2018, 2019, when he was a senior in high school, I mean, he was not only ranked, but if you looked at like the NBA mock drafts for the two years after that, you know, they were considering him a one and done player and he was oh, going to wow. be, uh, he's going to be an NBA draft pick. And it just never materialized mainly because of injuries for him and, and the reason why I'm a little bit surprised that he's going to try another school is um, it kind of similar to Mackenzie Milton, I guess. Uh, not that uh, not that that's a totally different story, you know, as to why he left. Uh, and, and certainly there's nothing there. But but it was almost like that. Uh, you know, you we, we, we nursed you back to health and, and you're and you and you're and you finally are starting to. It's a terrible analogy. I'm going to get off of the Mackenzie Milton thing, but it was it was a. Uh, you know, with, with him, it was like, we kind of, because you were injured so much, like it, it, we kind of never saw your full potential here. And then now you're leaving and, the, and then wish you the best, but uh, it's, it's, it's too bad that he's, uh, he's, he's trying another way. And then Marcellus Avery, he provided some good spark off the bench um, and he had some big games. Um, uh, his length and his athleticism and his, I, I mean, he has, has some good ability and, and I, I was, he was one of my favorite players, especially the first half of the season. I said it many times on this podcast that he was like one of my favorite players to watch because I thought he provided so much spark and energy. There were certain games where it did seem like he was a little bit, little bit like disinterested in like sticking to the game plan. So, um, you know, maybe maybe there was some you know kind of friction there. Um, uh, or, or just, you know, again, this is kind of the new normal, like they're, the, you know, players are just, are just moving on and he wasn't necessarily a starter this year. So maybe he thinks he can be a starter somewhere else and that's, that's fine. Um, and I wish them the best, but, uh, I think what's, what's, what's interesting about this time of this year, and I've already said this, but like, you know, the, the transfer portal, uh, takes away from us right now and and we'll have to see what what it'll give to us soon um uh and so those four players are, are gone and demar langford lastly i i i actually thought that he was like out of eligibility uh, so uh, again that wasn't really much of a surprise there he kind of played limited minutes even though we started in the beginning of the season yeah i mean obviously like you said yeah we know who the two biggest losses are but um, I mean, CJ Walker. Yeah. I think that's a good point. He was, he's going to be in his last year or he was going to be gone anyway. So, you know, the long term with him, you know, he didn't have a 
much of a future left here anyways. He's, you know, at the point where he's either going to go pro or, um, you know, whatever, go overseas. And um, so only had one more year left maximum. But, yeah, Avery's obviously a loss. Um, but, you know, it was good to see, you know, guys like Sellers say that they're returning, some of the yeah. really key guys in this team. So, um, but speaking of, you know, kind of new guys, I mean, in this trade, did you have anything you want to talk about on the transfers? <laughs> I, I don't really know too much about all that. <laughs> just on the note that you just said, just to just to reiterate it for the fans, uh, right now UCF has five scholarship players on their roster for next season. That's Darius Johnson, Ty Tyler Hendricks, Nils Mahoski, Jalen Sellers, and Tierno Silla. And we have two incoming uh, players – and that's Cameron Simpson, a three-star high school guard, and Mikey Williams, who's a transfer guard, which we've talked about numerous times on this show. And we don't have, which we're going to get to next. Go ahead, Alan. We 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 don't have somebody else that we thought we were going to. Yeah, well, actually, before you – and then – so the other guys that were scholarship this year, they're, they're most of them just graduated, right? I mean, that's pretty much the rest of right. them that you didn't need. They're all graduated. Okay. Yeah, yeah sure. everyone else is graduating. So, like, guys like, you know, uh, Diallo, um, you know, like the high contributors like that. Uh, uh, Shamari Allen, you know, they were fifth, six-year guys. Their COVID year was gone. Like, they, they have no more eligibility left. So, those contributors weren't able to come back no matter what the school. So, the only transfers were the guys that you mentioned. Right. So that brings us to, yeah, you know, someone we were supposed to have um, that was part of the 2024 high school recruiting class. And that's uh, um, oh. was someone that signed in the 24 class with Simpson um, was a is a four star guy. But it was just announced this week that UCF is granting his release from his national letter of intent. Um, I'm not sure, Ben, maybe you could speak more of this, if there was reason behind why he changed his mind after signing with us and uh, what kind of went down there. And, and you know, is should UCF have ultimately allowed that release? Or remember George O'Leary one time, uh, there was a quarterback from Louisville that uh, he said, no, you're not getting out of your, uh, your NLI. <laughs> so should UCF have pulled a strong arm on him? And, and what insight do you have under why he ultimately – switches the decision after what, like a month after signing date's been maybe a month and a half. Yeah. It's been a little while. It's a little, it might've been even beyond that. Cause I think some basketball players are able to sign in that early um, signing period yeah, before. Right. Yeah. So it's been a little while since he's been fully committed to UCF. Um, and I, I, I unfortunately don't have any insight as to why he decided to, as he put on his Twitter, mutually part ways with the UCF <laughs> basketball program um, I think that this is this is the part that like I don't think I'll ever get used to uh, with this new era of of full on player empowerment where com the word commitment means nothing. Uh, I don't think I'll ever get used to this part. The transfer portal is something that I think is just like is, it is what it is. Like I think I'll get used to that, and I, and I have gotten used to that for the most part. I've just kind of recalibrated my thinking on, hey, it's going to be a new team every season. And I'm just going to cheer for what's on the front of the jersey, and we'll see what happens. Um, but but I think the the part that bothers me the most about this is is these players, it happened twice last season. I mean, it happened later than this last season with the two players that left. I mean, we're talking, it, it happened over the summer where Joey Grant and um, a player that I can't, I, his, his Padmas was his first name. He was a European player that I can't pronounce his last name, but both of those players left after they signed their national letter of intent and they were left, they were let out of that fully by the school. And that's the situation with KJ Green here. And uh, what bother, bothers me the most about this is that when you sign your name on a sheet of paper, like that's, that's a, I that mean, that would be about as binding as it gets. And, um, and that should be the commitment that you're going to go to that school for at least 
uh, you know, your freshman year at the in, you know, in this instance, your freshman year, you are going to give everything that you can because you've gone through a three or four year in some cases for these high level recruits, re recruiting like gauntlet. You've had plenty of time to make your decision and 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 you've made your decision you've made your commitment we have made we being the basketball program in this case has made plans around you being here and those plans shouldn't be disrupted anymore because we because it's too late it's really it's not too late necessarily but it's like it's much later than what we would what we would want to from a high school recruiting standpoint to like change those plans now. And that and I think one of the tweets I saw and I, I forgive me, I wish I could I should I could credit who said it as far as this word. But um, they use the word unsustainable. And I think that's that's the part that bothers me the most, like these players being released from their NLI after they have signed it, sometimes months after they've signed it, like we're going into the off season. We're going into the recruiting cycle that is like hot and heavy for transfers, not necessarily for high school recruits anymore for next season. And for them to be let out of their NLI at this point, I think is an unsustainable model. If this continues year after year for any basketball program, let alone the one that we love so much. Right. And that's the part that really bothers me the most. It's a, it's not, I, I don't know anything about KJ Green personally. Uh, I don't have anything to say to him as a, or say about him as a basketball player, but it's more about the about what happened in this situation that happened to us twice last year and now once this season, where we're like like that word unsustainable. I think is an appropriate one. Like it, we we can't keep doing this to ourselves. Like we can't we can't have this happen to us because. We're not going to be able to build a true culture for the future if we don't have any high school players on our roster that are of any significance. Yeah, I, I 100 percent agree with that. And it, it really I think this whole new wave of college in general as its current model is unsustainable, let alone the yeah. letting, out, letting out of the NLI. I mean, just when you when you pair the transfer portal with now taking away the one time transfer, you go at any time pairing that with, um, you know, NIL. It just makes it crazy. There's got to be more things like if we're going to treat, you know, this like the pros and they need to sign one or two year deals and they can't just, you know, you can't like Aaron Rodgers can't just be like, yeah, I'm transferring tomorrow. Like it doesn't work that way if you have a, a contract. Right. So um, my, my issue, though, is like whether UCF let him out of his of his NLI or not with how transferring is now, if we said no, he could literally just transfer in the first window, which literally happens right before the season. So right. yeah, I guess in theory, he would be sacrificing his freshman year. I think that would be the rule. If you transfer that late, uh, once class has already started, you can't play, but there's no difference. I mean, if he wants, if he wants to leave, the guy's going to leave. So even if we forced him to say he, he would, you know, he would just be like, all right, well, I'm out at the first window, which is literally, you know, this before the start of the season anyways. So that's why I don't even get the point of them signing these things, the NI NLIs anymore, because I saw with the football team, there was several guys when Hypo switched over to Malzahn, when we had that transition guys that literally left uh, like in August, a month before or two months before the Once season was starting, uh, didn't play a single, didn't have a single fall, uh, didn't see a single game at UCF on the bench or on the field and left several guys did that. So it's like, what, what's the point of them even signing it? So if he wanted out, he was going to leave. Um, but yeah, I, but going back to the, to the basis of this, yeah, the, the, I think it's an unsustainable model. Yeah. Yeah. It's rough. I mean, I mean, yeah. I even told you guys on the, on the text talk when we, when we got the commitment from Mikey Williams and all the hype that was around that. I'm like, I'm like, talk to me when he's actually suiting up for UCF, then I'll get excited just because you just don't know anymore. Like you can't get excited about even a recruiting class, even a recruiting right. class. You can't get excited about. I mean, this isn't just basketball. I remember in football too. I mean, there's, there's plenty of times like you just, you just said where we were excited about certain players and they never really saw the field. I mean, Jordan McDonald is a great example of that. Like, saw the field in limited time and I, I, I can't re I can't think of another you know recruit that we were more excited about in that recruiting cycle uh, from an offensive standpoint than Jordan McDonald and he never you know materialized here. Yeah no it's absolutely true. Um, Trey you got anything? Yeah I mean just kind 
I don't really understand why you let him out of the NIL, barring something like extreme, like a death in the family, like something crazy where it's like, okay, otherwise, why, like to me, like what was the point of committing, like in the first place? Like what changed from November, I think that's when he signed when I looked it up, to December, yeah. To, yeah, to like November, December, three months, four months. What's changed, barring a – you know, an Personal. extreme event. Yeah, which then I, I get it, you know, but other than that, like, what's changing? And, and I think that's just the emotions of, you know, 17, 18 year olds. Sometimes they're like, you know, I want to go here. And then three months later, eh, I don't feel like it. But like, I feel like that's where the recruiting on the front end, you have to be more diligent. I don't think kids ultimately think that. I, I think you have to be very diligent in your recruiting process. I, I don't think kids are necessarily doing that now. I think it's more so who can offer me the most money? Who can like you know? I think the the mindset. I think that's there. the bottom line. Is the reason yeah. why Nick Saban isn't coaching anymore. Yeah, it's like, why Mike Krzyzewski isn't coaching anymore. Exactly. Yeah, it's why all these guys are stepping down because that relationship doesn't matter anymore. It, and, and that's there used to be a reason like that you mentioned Nick Saban. Like yeah, he was recruiting all the five stars. But when you tell me, hey, you want to play on Sundays? You want to learn? You want to graduate? I can get you there. That's worth sitting two years if you have to do that. You know, now there's always the one in in a blue moon freak show freshman that plays as a freshman, but that was always worth it. Same thing that Coach O'Leary told me. He was like, listen, I already we already have our DB set, but I think <laughs> you're gonna be a, you know, but I think you're gonna be a great one. Look at my track record of who I put in the NFL, like, and you're gonna have your degree. Like, and I think to me that was like, okay, that's a no-brainer, you know, and everybody doesn't sell that. I don't think kids kind of look at that. And I think that's what that's just the difference. Like you said, I think kids are like, oh, how much money can you offer me? Oh, you can offer me that? What can you offer me? And then I don't know the money situation at UCF. I, I don't know. But if if that's all he was chasing, you're going to be like, okay, I got the money. Now what? Like, I don't want to be – like, I, I think that's just a poor way to go about recruiting. And, and that's the crazy – I mean, that's why, like Alan said, like, I mean, this whole, like, wild, wild west, the way college sports is right now, yeah. like, I mean, until we get some sort of regulations around this, it's just going to keep being – like, it's, it's just – it's ultimately, it's not good. It's it's not even good for the players that are involved in it. In my opinion, like it's just not. Like it's it's not a not to overuse the word, but it's just not sustainable model for anybody. Like not even the fans. I mean, the fans are the ones that get hurt the most. I think, which is by the way, the ones that are funding all this stuff. So like, I, I just yeah. man, it's just wild. I, I just this whole wild wild west of of. Uh, of college sports right now because the NCAA has lost all of its power is just, um, is just kind of just, it's not, it's an ugly era. I think it's just, it's, and we enjoy it when our teams are having success. And certainly if, if you see if a football team or whatever, you know, takes off and does things on the national stage, like I'm going to be rooting for it a hundred percent because they're UCF. But by the same token, it's like, it's like if any team, like it feels like feels like nothing's really real at this point. <laughs> it's like there right. is no there is no loyalty. I mean, loyalty is even you can't even approach the word loyalty. It's like doesn't like, exist anymore. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't exist at all. And it's just like I, I may remember. I mean, yeah, as, I'm you know I'm much older than you guys, but like I, I mean, as far as like obviously it was the case when I was growing up. It's like you wanted to go to these certain schools because like of tradition and like your family and, and like, and like you, you wanted to go there because you you felt like a connection with the, with the school and the, and the coaching staff and all of that, like that, like that was part of the whole deal. Like now it just seems like that, like some players, not all, not all players, because I know some high school recruits that are pretty highly touted that are, that are not necessarily, going down that path but by the same token it seems like overall like a lot of these high school big you know top high school recruits even not the top high school recruits are just kind of like yeah okay i hear you they're like they're like all the all the players in blue chip basically blue chips <laughs> that movie in blue chips like they're basically like cool coach uh what can you give me and uh, there's been a lot of uh of tractors being taken, <laughs> being put out there, but it's all out in the open and it's all legal now. So it's just wild to uh, to see the movie Blue Chips just basically come to fruition 
but in a in a out in the open way like there's no there's there's uh there's just there's there's no shame about it anymore they it's like they don't even seem to care about where they're going they don't even seem to care about you know who the coach is it's just a matter of who's who can open up their wallets the most yep yeah it's it's a shame because I, I always say I say that I've said this on my page ever since like this all, this new wave of of college athletics came in but like it sounds corny but I think it's like just destroyed the charm of like college athletics like I've always loved like the fact that it felt in like in college that you were p- truly playing for the letters on the front of your chest whereas in pros you know it's not it's not there yes there's some guys that have you know you know sentimental to one team they played their whole career but you see in pros right. now like basketball where guys are just gone and there's no loyalty so like it, in college you 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 know 90 percent of the time before all this happened the guys that were in every class were graduating from there so you you could really have a, a you know respect for these guys and be true fans of them because they were there for four or five years and i think i put this I counted this a couple months ago out of all of the guys that were eligible to graduate this year from UCF's football team that were started at UCF and finished at UCF. It was seven total players in the, in the whole like 25 person senior class that started and finished at UCF. So not guys that came in transferred in or whatever, and obviously guys transferred out. So, you know, a guy like Traymond Morris Brash, like you start to, appreciate and think how special it is mm-hmm. now to have a guy that was here from freshman year to senior year. It's like, of course you still love a guy like Javon, Javon Baker that graduated from UCF and you still count him as a knight, but like the truly like start from finish, like, and especially in basketball, that's just like never going to exist yeah. anymore. It's, it's sad. It really is. You, because, have more, you have more players on their third or fourth school than you do right. players that have gone there for, since their, their freshman year. That's what's crazy. It is. And it, it sucks because I, I, you know, that was, but if you're going to, if we're going to make it exactly like the pros, then I would at least like to see like a contract where you can't leave three months later after you sign with a team and make it a little bit more regimented like that. At least there would be guys that there'd be a little bit less turnover and a little bit more consistency. If you have maybe higher level players that are signing, you know, bigger NIL deals for their signing for two years and three years. And they're actually in that contract, but how it is now, like you said, we'll just keep using the word. It's unsustainable. Right. Yeah. It's just, it's just, it's just crazy. So, yeah, I mean, like, think about it, the, think about the the seniors that were on the 2013 UCF football team. Think of the seniors that were on the 2017 or 2018 UCF football team. Like think about like that senior class was like, especially the 2017, like you, I remember like so many of those seniors. I mean, obviously Trey, you, you were on that team and you played with those guys. Like, I just, I remember so many of them. And there were just like, I, I was just like, wow, these, this is the winningest class in UCF football history. And, and it's like, you appreciated every single one of them that had been there that long. And it's just like, uh, had, had went through so much for the school and they went through so much for the school, like for each other and for the fans and for everything. Exactly. Just, all that connection is just gone. It just seems like that. I mean, we went from that to seven years later where you just said what you just said, like seven players. We went from that to, to seven players in less than a decade. And those were guys that were on the team before this transfer portal existed. So it's going to be really interesting to see yeah. a guy that came up in the transfer por- or uh, in the era of the transfer portal, the guys that were freshmen, for example, last year, the year before, how many of those guys will stay all four years? Yeah. Yeah. And this is, and this is the last season. This is the last year of the, of the extra COVID year where you could stay in school an extra year. Five, six year guys. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're going to see less of the five, six year guys, but I think we're going to see even, even less of the commitment, which is wild. Yeah. Sad to say, hopefully something changed at one point, but that kind of uh, brings us into UCF football. So we don't have a ton of talk, uh, stuff here, but this could end up being a very long conversation depending on where it goes. But before we get into what we alluded to last week about Malzahn, um, we could talk maybe a little bit about spring ball. So um, from what I know and love to get your guys' thoughts and Trey and everything, um, you know, basically UCF j- did just have its first spring scrimmage. Uh, I believe it happened this past weekend. Um, you know, obviously, Gus Malzahn keeps everything close to to chest and, you know, there, I don't think a ton of stuff was released, but UCF social media did put out some, some clips that have been going on throughout spring 
uh, in general. We've seen some pretty uh, cool passes from KJ Jefferson to Kobe Hudson, uh, Kobe Hudson getting some touchdowns. Um, and then there's been some buzz about, um, you know, obviously it's all come from UCF's camp, but there's been a lot of buzz about some of the transfers like with Darius Tennyson, obviously KJ Jefferson, um, some of these, you know, Ethan Barr, some of these defensive guys have come over, you know, veteran guys. But I think the the most hype I've really heard is around some of these new freshmen, you know, Trey, you talked about how it was the best recruiting class in school history. Um, Burdell Richardson, the three-star wide receiver had an insane one-handed grab uh, in practice that was circulating. It was like a uh, Randy Moss type of one-handed catch. It was really cool. And then we've heard a lot about Jalen Hayward, who was actually, who is UCF's highest ever rated defensive back in school history um, by 247. And he's apparently pretty much every player, Lee Hunter, uh, every guy in the defense has all said, like raving reviews of him that he doesn't appear like a freshman, someone that's going to get playing time essentially right away. Um, so that that's all, you know, great stuff. Um, other than that, you know, we've heard a couple injuries. Xavier Townsend is uh, dealing with an injury. Kobe Hudson was actually dealing with an injury. Um, but for the most part, they seem healthy. Gus Malzahn is saying everything is going smoothly, pretty much most of it's coach speak, but he's saying everything sounds good. And Katie Jefferson's learning the playbook, but, you know, has looked good and some, on some, uh, you know, plays with some of his top targets. Um, any any takeaways you guys have, Trey, maybe from, you know, spring, if you've noticed anything? Yeah, I mean, like you said, I think I was talking about Jalen because he's the one that – he's from Georgia and de- decommitted from UGA. Um, yeah. He was the one that Gus wanted badly. I think they offered him when he was in ninth grade, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, he's, he's the one that I was hearing that even during the year, like, if we can keep him. He, he's going to come in and be kind of like that Braden Marshall. Like he's going to play early. He's going to get a lot of snaps early if, you know, keeps his head on straight, you know, stays out of trouble. Um, And then, like you said, Brodell Richardson, he's who Roger's been raving about. Like, I think people have been telling him that, uh, you know, losing Javon Baker is kind of it, – it was it's a huge loss. Um, As yeah. you see, he's, he's a great player. But they feel a lot better with that loss because of who – you know, they have coming in. And I think that's the guy they've been talking about a lot. Um, But yeah, I mean, it, it's spring. It, it's, this is where you want to see those young guys and you want to see the guys that, you know, maybe haven't gotten a lot of reps and now they're going to get that chance with some guys moving on. Um, But I, I'm just interested, again, I'm interested to see, you know, who, who becomes that leader. You know, I think we were kind of missing that last year. I think JRP was that guy. Um, But again, when he's injured and his play suffers, who, who's that leader? We always knew when I played, I, I hate, you know, going back to it, but we always knew Shaquem Griffin was, that, that was our leader. You know, we knew day in, day out, he was going to work hard. You know, he's going to show up on, on Saturdays. We always knew that, you know. Um, so it was easy to kind of follow him. And then, you know, the story, and we, we saw all the work behind it. Um, who's going to be this guy, that guy on this team? You know, and I think, to me, the leadership is what carries you. You know, you, we alluded to it with basketball. When, when most of the guys buy in, playing that gritty tough kind of foot or basketball the even guys who might be discontent or have a problem with it you you can't tell because everybody's bought in you know i think if you can find that we can find those guys football wise um because it, it changes every year um if we can find that football wise and, and find our identity um i i think we could be special especially the way you know we're bringing back a lot of guys a lot of skill positions um a lot of experience on the defensive end specifically and there's some holes to fill, but we're filling them with talented guys who are there now. You know, I think it's it speaks volumes to being there from January compared to coming in, you know, late May. That Those four months of just weight room, conditioning, getting in the playbook, it's it's a difference maker. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see, you know, Jalen Hayward just because, again, he played DB. You know, I always keep my eye on him. Um, but, you know, some of the guys on offense like Bruno Richardson, uh, Kylan Fox, I think he was another big-time guy that Gus got yeah. the tight end. Um, yeah, the tight end yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. He's a so big dude, um, right? Huge, yeah, my yeah. Bro- my brother actually knows him when he was a younger. He was, I think, in seventh grade. My brother was telling him he was like, "You need to go to UCF because I was there at the time." Um, <laughs> so it's, cr- I mean, it's just crazy just how small the world is. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to see it. Um, I won't be out at the spring game, but you know, God, there's going to be guys there, and we're going to talk, and they're going to, they'll a, a lot of the times when you know you see the reports of things. Sometimes it's not necessarily 
as accurate as what you see on the sideline, what, you know, kind of the mannerisms and the demeanor of guys and how people act on them. So, yeah, I mean, it's, sure. it's coach Malzahn's going to give you the coach speak. He, he's notorious for it. I think every coach does for the most part. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. I think it's going to be an interesting year um, as we go into this next year. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. So the uh, highlight film that they put out on, on uh, UCF's Twitter on uh, the, the spring scrimmage, there was like two like crazy one-handed catches. Were they both by Richardson? Number four, Is he number four? Uh, no, four is um, – that's – that's uh, is that Hudson's one, right? I'm trying to think. Hudson's Maybe four, two, no, yeah, or at least four, it was two eight, last year. Yeah. Townsend KG, is three. One. Yeah, you, Kobe Hudson is two. Yeah, and then I'm not sure. I think four might be. I think that is Richardson. It's either Richardson or Gerard Baker. I'm I'm drawing a blank, but um, I actually the the one handed catch I was talking about. You you said it was from the spring game or just spring ball. You were you were spring scrimmage. The, spring, the 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 first oh, scrimmage. Okay, so the one I was talking about. There was one in practice. Yeah, I was talking about one in practice that UCF released like two or three weeks ago. So if there was two more crazy ones from him in the spring game, that's even better. I didn't, I didn't see those yet. Oh yeah, and in, in this this first spring scrimmage, which I guess was actually, oh, wow. it yeah. was actually Saturday. Yeah, there's one right at the end that uh, of the highlight reel that I'm looking at from number four that he like high pointed a ball and tipped it in the air to himself and he catches that, it. Comes yeah, down I, think, it. I think that's Braden Marshall, the DB. That might be Braden Marshall, number four. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I but, saw I saw a receiver number before that made a one to catch too. Yeah, but I, obviously, so. yeah. I mean, it's going to be this this offense going to be crazy. So <laughs> I'm so excited about that. I mean, the the amount of speed and power that they have. Uh, I mean, it'll be it'll be interesting. To, it'll be fun to watch. Hopefully, so I, I I'm just interested in the in the kind of just the spring storylines that you just you'll never get a straight answer on but like i i am curious i i i am really curious who's going to be the backup quarterback next season we're probably not going to know until the the first notes come out before the first game you know yeah um uh but uh i i i don't feel like that's that's really a lock for timmy mcclain at all um uh i i that's with zero info inside information um but uh uh, we certainly have some talent at the quarterback position uh, behind KJ Jefferson, yeah. um, and so that'll be interesting. And then, and then also just the other, like maybe it's not a battle, maybe it should be a battle. Is it a battle? Is uh, are we? Is is Boomer going to be our guy? So that's going to be interesting too. You know, the place kicker battle. Like, is he has he gotten over the yips that we saw at the end of the last season? So yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it's funny. It feels like for the first time in quite a long time, we don't have a QB battle. Like I, I know last year, JRP was kind of cemented as a guy, but there were still question marks around him. So it feels like this is the first time where we just have like a bona fide. Yes, he's QB one. Yes, he's really good. We all unanimously kind and of we're just, excited about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we all unanimously have maybe blind faith in him because it's funny. You look at his stats at Arkansas; they're good. They're He's never had a 3,000 yard passing yard mm -hmm. uh, year in his career. I mean, he's had a lot of touchdowns when you com combine rushing and passing. And, and there's no doubt he's, he's uh, on paper, notoriety wise, talent wise, the best quarterback we've had since Dylan Gabriel. I don't think there's any question that we've all already unanimously said he's QB one. He's going to have a special year. He's coming from the SEC, all this stuff. So that kind of takes a lot of element of, spring storylines out of it it's always a little bit more exciting when there's a qb battle even though right. it's nicer to have a, a cemented quarter qb1 but uh for me yeah the offense really doesn't have any storylines i mean a couple minor ones like who's going to be wide receiver three like is it bradell richardson which it seems to be the early favorite who's going to kind of fill in those last couple of line spots with some of the graduations we had like grable and and loki paule um, but really to me, the, all the storylines outside of the one you mentioned, Ben, with, with the kicking situation comes on defense because, right. you know, we, we've, there's no doubt we've, we brought in, we reinforced with a ton of talent, but there's just yeah. so many names right now. And there is just not clear where's go outside a defensive line where we brought back literally every single defensive tackle from last year and almost every D end, um, it's the, the, the linebackers and the secondary is just completely up in the air. I think we've all agreed that we have a bunch of talent there and the guys we brought in, whether it's freshmen or transfers are all good. And we have some returning talent, but there's just so many things that are unclear. Like linebackers, a brand new group completely. Yeah. There's not one starter back from last year. So there's a lot of questions there. Is it going to be 
the guys you brought in and even some of the DB transfers we brought in were linebackers at their previous school. So are they going to maybe get into the mix at linebacker, even though UCF has listed them as DB transfers officially like Deshaun Pace. And then the secondary, same thing outside of, you know, maybe like a Brandon Adams and Nakai Martinez and Damari Henderson. There's a ton of new safeties. I think four were brought in a couple new corners. So I yeah. think most of the storylines are going to be there. And then when you add that with the fact that we have a new DC, and maybe a new playbook or whatever. That's where, to me, that most matters. of the storylines are going. Yeah. Yep. All, all of that matters because, again, even though you're injecting the defense with new talent plus a new play caller. So his style, you know, even though you have Addison, you have the guy still carrying over, his style of what he sees as the defense could be a little bit different. It reminds me a lot of, you know, my 2014 year when I redshirted, we went from Coach Summers who was the defensive coordinator to coach Bresnan. Um, Granted, 2015 did not go how anybody wanted, but like just the way they saw defense was different. So they saw the skill sets of players that may have gone underlooked, um, you know, and with Coach Summers, Coach Bresnan saw that. You know, for example, he saw some skill set in, in Mark Rucker. That was kind of the first time I saw, um, we call him Ruck, like Ruck, his ability to kind of just play football was when Coach Brez put him at back, back at linebacker because he was a safety when I was with him. Um, but, like, he flashed early, and then, obviously, he got benched and didn't see him again until Coach Frost's oh, year. But, yeah. yeah, but, like, it's it's one of those things where different D.C. see different abilities in people, and, and on the turn, they can see maybe a flaw that we kind of overlook. They might see it more glaring. So it, it, all, it all, truthfully, it's going to look different. You know, they might see Nakai Mart- And with how we recruited – a lot of these guys can play corner. They can play safety. They can play nickel. Um, they might see them fit in different roles in different areas. You know, Nakai played safety last year. His first year, he was the star or the, the you know, the night, which is just the nickel. Yeah. Uh, Braden Marshall, he played nickel a lot this year. He could be outside. Like, it's so many different combinations. And I think that's kind of like you said, the storylines you're going to see is who do we trot out week one? Because I think this is – these things are going to battle, you know, throughout the rest of summer. Um and throughout fall ball, because I think you really separate the guys separate to me in fall ball. Um, because that's where it's like the grind. That's where you're not playing every other day. You're practicing every day, you know, guys in week two, the end of week two, they start slacking off. The playbook gets bigger, bigger. You're installing every day. Those guys start falling off. The starters always end up showing then, you know, cause they take that next step. Um, so it'll be interesting. I, I think you're going to see a lot of talent in the back end, but, like this is my whole point. Like you guys, you know, like you said, there's we're we're excited about the offense because we're bringing the quarterback with that's good that we have no issues with. Um, we're bringing back receivers that are great. We're bringing back tight ends. You know, a few holes. Running backs, yeah. Stud running back, yeah. Stud running, running, running back. back. So, yeah. what should be the expectations bringing all this back? You know, we're we have a change of defensive coordinator, yeah, but we're bringing back you know the D line, D- new linebackers, but a lot of dip, a lot of talent is on this roster. We're not going to say this roster's talent deficient as maybe you could say basketball. We're kind of squeezing the juice out of it. We're not squeezing the juice out of this. We have plenty of oranges, plenty of every kind of juice to go around for football. So Yeah, one of those storylines that I'm really excited about, uh, just and you guys mentioned it, just, you know, the defensive line. Like, like I want to see how good a guy like John Walker can be in year two. Like, yeah. like yeah. I want to see, like, the, like these, these are cave and call. Like, these recruits that were, like, the highly, highly touted freshman recruits that got like really good minutes and showed some great things last year. Like how good can they be in their sophomore year? Like that, that I, part on the I defense mean, is a storyline that is really exciting. Yeah. To be honest with you, Ben, it's like John Walker's jump. Like he reminds me a lot of like the Tristan Hill. I don't know if like everybody remembers. Yeah. yeah when, he, sure. when Tristan was a freshman, he was just – all talent like he right. really didn't know how to play college ball yet like he was so strong I mean, he was squatting a thousand pounds um That's as an 18 as an 18 year old but it didn't every snap didn't translate to him playing like he could squat a thousand pounds as a freshman but his sophomore year it was like like you could see it he was yeah. moving everybody and again john walker i don't i don't know what his weight room numbers are but just off the hoof of recruiting Tristan Hill, I think he was like a, a low two star, three star kind of guy. John Walker was a big time prospect. Oh, yeah. 
Like he and he has the measurables. He's not a small kid. Like he's a big kid. Um, so again, that year one to year two jump could be, you know, a yeah. first team all big 10, 12 kind of guy blooming all American. Like to me, that's kind of the expectation, at least for me. Like, yeah, sure that's he has wild, it's like he yeah. could be that good. Like, yeah, like that's the recruit. He was, <laughs> like, he could be like, really his first he year, too. Be, yeah, that's the re- kind of level of recruit we have in you know our program. Which I mean, how many guys can we say we recruited that was like? He's gonna be an all American, or he's like we expect him to be a all American type of player. Yeah, I don't remember any guys like that, like not as recruits in you know year one. Now, did Mackenzie Millen obviously turn out to be a stud? Absolutely, you know, Adrian Killens, all those guys they turn out to be studs, but nobody after seeing them play freshman year were like, Yeah, they're gonna be all American. Like, I think right. he's one of those guys that's it's you been know, very few that we've seen like that, yeah, in two to three years he's going to have that kind of, you know, pedigree as a player. And I think, you know, Lee Hunter, even though he didn't start with us, he has that kind of almost that pedigree, not, maybe not to the extent, but like, you know, those are the kind of recruits that we're getting in. So I think, like you said, it's, that's what I expect. You know, I'm sure it's higher for him, but, and maybe that's too lofty, but I, I think he could do it. Cause I saw Tristan Hill take that jump. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, just as a talent, he might be more talented than Tristan and Tristan. We're talking about a second round draft pick in the NFL. Right. So what are we talking? A, a first round guy? All those first round guys are all Americans. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. All yeah. Long. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's interesting and too. I mean, going back just the defensive storylines, you have that like someone like John Walker potentially blossoming into an all American. But I think also one of the biggest storylines of last year carries over into this year and is will the run D be better? I mean, we yeah. we talked about that ad nauseum mm-hmm. week after week, and that to me, when you talk about just all the defensive players, individual player storylines, and them as a unit, but but this is a huge one. Is UCF going to have some semblance of a of a run? Uh, you know, D where last year we finished bottom ten nationally, and it was a huge reason yeah. why we you know lost games or at least was a big contributor and yeah. so now we're looking at will that's the to me is the biggest story in the defense obviously of the new coach and and several new coaches there you know the cornerback coach and you have all these mm-hmm. new transfers and, and recruits but the big thing is will they improve their run d and i think we have to start seeing that like in the spring the spring game i mean yeah. I, I if we if we're hearing because i remember as early as the spring last year where you're already hearing some stuff with the linebackers are kind of sketchy again. You know, you have Jason Johnson, yeah. but what else do you really have there? If we're kind of hearing that again, you know, that's going to be troublesome for me. Like, you know, this time Gus Malzahn was like, I'm not bringing in big names. I'm bringing in experienced veterans who, who I oh, guess true. in their own right were big names, but, you know, bringing in guys that have proven it already at the college level for multiple yeah. years. I mean, pretty much every linebacker he's brought in is an upperclassman, either a senior redshirt senior, and they've all played ext- either as starters or heavy backups for their teams, most of them in the SEC uh, yeah. or in other power conferences. So to me, that's also a huge storyline. Yeah, I- exactly. I mean, I can't tell you how many weeks I came on here and said we lost because of the run defense, you know. And and I think that's one of those things where, you know, some of it was – schematics you know looking back at it it was like why are we not loading the box because we saw it when we played oklahoma state ollie gordon they love to run the football just put everybody in the box and make them beat you another way we did it okay. and it worked you know but then you see the other eight nine games and it's like where is that method like what changed in the the scheme that made you change to do that so i think it's a little bit of that but again i think to me defense is so much how much more do you want it it's same thing with basketball do you want to play defense you know, right. do you want to be gritty? Do you want to be tough? Do you want to be physical on defense? Or do you just not want to? You know, for us, we don't get to play offense, but that's what defense is. Now, is it there are a lot of finesse and skill in it involved? Yeah, but at the end of the day, it's we're, we're out there to try to deflate and punk the offense and out physical. Yeah. You know, that's what it is. And I didn't see that last year. Hopefully that changes because I think if that changes, naturally the defense should improve in the run defense because all stopping the run is is – can I get knocked back? You know, can the defensive line knock back the O-line? Can linebackers knock back tight ends, fullback? And can safeties knock back – safeties corners knock back receivers? And when it's time to tackle, is there a knockback or are you getting ran over and they're falling over for two yards? That's all defense is run game-wise. You know, pass game is so much more. But that's what I think. If they can do that, I think they're going to be fine. And, again, combat that with – you combine that with the offense that should be potent. I don't – 
we should win a lot of games. That's my <laughs> yeah. I don't think you would think. I, I mean, we got the we got the team for it. Yeah, the expectations and, are there. Yeah, and and I was you know kind of going to the gust thing. Like I went back and looked at just you know what his seasons were in the SEC, and I I'm not saying we're in the SEC, but I think we have an expectation for football. I think now you know Texas and Oklahoma are a big program that left. Uh, we bring in Utah, Colorado, Arizona, Arizona State. Still good program. They're not Texas and Oklahoma as far as just giants. I think realistically with what we have, the talent, we should be top four in the conference minimum. Like, we just have too much more. We, we recruit too well. We have too many guys coming back at key positions. We should be a top four team, a contending team for a conference championship or getting to the conference championship. What does that mean? I don't know how it plays out wins loss wise, but like that's what we should be. I think going forward, barring you know a total rebuild of a year, that should be the expectation for us. Um, and I think again, eight wins isn't good enough, in my opinion. You know, if we lose four games, I don't see four games on the schedule we should lose talent wise. We might lose it coaching wise, we might lose it, you know, just doing dumb things on the field, but talent wise, we shouldn't lose four games. So I mean, what what are your guys' expectations for football? Because again, this this was my whole issue with how we look at Gus Malzahn versus Johnny Dawkins. Like this is where it, it kind of started from, was just how we look at it. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, the expectation, yeah, I have sky high expectations for the UCF football pretty much every year. I mean, I they get tempered in years like, like last year when I knew, I mean, Vegas had us at six wins and I, I completely agree with that. I, I was not expecting a, some crazy year one uh, in, yeah. the, in the big 12, but, but outside of last year, dating back to 2000, you know, I would even say 2014 after his 13 year, my expectations grew and grew. And then after 17, 18, they did. I'm never the guy that's like, Oh, we should go undefeated every year. That's just unrealistic. Yeah. Alabama, Clemson and all these, they don't go undefeated every year, but exactly. my expectations every single year is to be, in the conference championship, or at least the, at, in the end, at, in the competition for it and competing for a major bowl game. It, it, you know, obviously now with a 12 team playoff, the major bowl game is not really that cool or really matter that much anymore, but yeah. you know, but that kind of vibe, a, a big game, or I guess in this case, kind of sort of, if you're, if you're competing for the conference championship, the big 12, you're then competing you are competing for, the playoff for a, spot. a playoff spot. Right. Exactly. So those are my expectations. And then when you, Pair that with a big name coach like Gus Malzahn with the type of recruiting, like you said, every year it's been the best class on paper every single year for the last three years. And the transfers that he brought in, the own expectations that he set on himself and said publicly with he's going all in. Um, yeah, I, I have very, very high expectations uh, for the football team next year and beyond. Um, but I, I think the, the greater conversation you wanted to have and uh, was, you know, what what is – what does that mean for Gus Malzahn? Does, is, is he kind of like the Johnny Dawkins? Um, has he underperformed? I know you had some thoughts on what his Auburn tenure was and are we yeah. maybe overrating him? Are we giving to him too much of a leash? Um, is he just completely built up goodwill purely from recruiting and that's it? Um, so I, I know you want to have some thoughts on yeah, that. I, I mean, and ben do. Per personally, I think he is, I think he's a good coach. I don't think he's a – the coach that we – he's kind of the pedestal on. Um, I, I think he has a lot of cachet from, you know, high school and then the recruiting ranks, as he should, because he's great at both of them. Um, I think he – that first run at Auburn where they went to the national championship carries him a long way. I think his Alabama wins have carried him a long way. Um, but, like, outside of that, it's a lot of underwhelming for the talent that he's had on his rosters. Uh, and I think I don't want to be stuck in this, in that boat. You know, I, I would rather be the flip side of, we might not have the most talent, but we maximize all of our talent. You know, I, I think, because, and again, I could, I have, bias. yeah. And I have bias because that's kind of what I saw, you know, even with guys, people like, Oh, you played with frost. What's the difference? I'm like, Mackenzie Milton wasn't a five-star prospect. Adrian Killens wasn't a five-star prospect. Gabe Davis wasn't a five. Like all these big name guys that you know now are big name UCF guys, they weren't four-star, five-star guys. They were two-star, three-star guys who worked their butts off. You know, 
who wish we had the talent of a John Walker, the talent of yeah. a Jabron Baker. You know, we wish we had that, but we maximized, we squeezed all the juice that we could out of it. You know, barring injuries to some guys and, you know, off the field stuff, for the most part of the guys that played and contributed, they maximized it. You know, and I think I would rather be that kind of program than, you know, oh, we have all this talent and it just never comes to fruition because – I don't think that's the trajectory we're headed. And and that's what I've seen with Gus's tenure, you know, not to say shame him. I'm, I'm just stating what I've seen. And I think for the past, you know, you can exclude this past year, but it <coughs> seems every year I've come off, we've underperformed, whether it be coaching decisions, whether it be you look back the talent we had on the team from, you know, who's played, you know, contributing football, things like that. So I, I just think, you know, the same kind of things we've, and this isn't just me saying like some of my, my former teammates have said the same things we are seeing from Johnny Dawkins, how people are complaining, like we have the talent and we underperform a little bit, or it's just, it's not exciting. You know, I think that's kind of what Gus is, is just, he is exciting a little bit more. And, and I think just football in general will be more exciting here. Um, so I don't know. It's just, just food for thought, you know, something to think about because again, I, I said last week, you know, in a year from now, if we go seven and five, eight and four, we might be having the same conversation. Like, is this the best we're going to get in this conference? Because Utah is a very good football program. You know that Colorado. Oh, yeah. I don't know. They're to be determined, but they have a lot of steam behind them, you know, just from Dion and all the theatrics and players he has because he has some big time guys. Um, But and then you have the guys, the mainstays, the Kansas States, the West Virginias, the you know, all the Kansas, you Oklahoma know, these State. teams, Oklahoma State, like these teams. TCU is the state national championship. Yeah, yeah. TCU yeah. Two, years ago, two years ago, we're in the national championship. So, like, yeah. these are, are they're not, it's not slouches we're going against. And we're recruiting against Texas schools. And we know the state of Texas can put out players, too. So, that, I think we do have the recruiting advantage because I think we're better programs than, like, the Floridas as of right now, Um, you know, the UM, Miami, as of right now. Um. But like Texas is no slouch in the recruiting game. They there's a lot of kids all over that state too. Um, so it's not like we're just head and shoulders above everybody. Like kind of like we were in the American. We still have, I think, the best recruits, but we're still there's still teams that can compete. So I, I just want to see, you know, a year, we're gonna be twelve months, not twelve months probably, but like nine, ten months from now, if we have another eight and four year with coaching mishaps at the end of the games, like like you said, Ben. Johnny Dawkins doesn't really adjust offensively, you know, mm-hmm. and that's something that's been a gripe. A gripe with a lot of people with Coach Malzahn is the adjustments and then the the, the play calling, the trick plays at inconvenient times, the, the play calling gets yeah. stale. Yeah. And, just, you know, like if we have that conversation year four with all of this talent, because this is a talented team, what? why wouldn't that be a conversation of, you know, is this peaked? Have we peaked? You know, and because you look at Auburn, Sorry to be long-winded. You look at Auburn, and that's kind of what it is. It was a lot of eight and four, eight and five. The one good year where they go to the national championship, or the one good year where they played us in the Peach Bowl. I think they beat you know Alabama and Georgia in the same year. Um, but you know, over eight years, those were like the highs. But then they otherwise, lost to us in the Peach Bowl, <laughs> and they lost to us in the Peach Bowl. But and like but otherwise, it was a lot of eight and four, seven and five, nine and three. You know, things like that where they're just middling fifth sixth best team in the conference and that ultimately got him fired you know so why would that be any different for us when we want to be a top 20 program we want to be competing for playoff spots every year or at minimum the conference championship which in turn makes us a playoff contender you know i think if we can't do that why wouldn't we have that conversation yeah i think he's been he's been here he's been here less years and he's certainly going to get more rope and with the excitement that's been around the program in general and, and him being like kind of the centerpiece of that. I think that, I think those, those couple things that you just mentioned there um, uh, amongst others was, was like, you want your coach to kind of, from an offensive standpoint, especially if he's an offensive coach, you want, you want to from a, like kind of be so unpredictable that you're just like, man, this guy's so crazy that he might pull out a crazy trick play at any moment. You never yeah. know. You got to be prepared for it. But then all of, a, all of a sudden, you don't want some of those trick plays to be like kind of like part of the playbook where you're like, you're seeing them all the time and kind of weird exactly. moments. And you're like, wait, wait, what's going on? Like, 
it's not a good thing if they're expecting a trick play because then it'll always get blown up. Exactly. Um, but uh, I think that was some of the things we saw last season, and then and then ultimately, I think um, as we might have lost Allen potentially. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think some of the other things that we're seeing is 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 what you just described the in game adjustments. I mean, and now granted they were. Um, they were happening a lot as far as what we saw on the defensive side of the ball. But I would, I would argue that maybe not so much last season, but the season before that, how many times on nightline did we talk about like, like, are they going to throw another bubble screen to Ryan O'Keefe? Like, uh, like how many times can we do this? Like it just, it felt like the actual offensive game plan, his first couple seasons, like, it took a while to get to get to that level of exactly of um and maybe that's part of personnel. So I'll give him a I'll give him a pass on that, right? He had to get his guys in there. He had to get his guys in there, and they had to be healthy in order to run his system. Uh, yeah. But there was some lack of creativity, uh, whether that whether that was you know uh, JRP in his first year not really grasping the playbook the way that he was supposed to, or um, or whatever that may be, it, it, it didn't seem like as creative as he was billed to be. And so I think that what the expectations are this season, especially from an offensive standpoint, from an offensive standpoint, I think it's you now have a weapon to run your offense that yes. we've never seen, at least at UCF. And honestly, we haven't seen in a long time under Coach Malzahn, you have a weapon in K.J. Jefferson to kind of be the centerpiece of your offense. And we fully expect that weapon to be able to run your offense like a full out. Maximize, like yeah, maximize, maximize the offense. So that's one thing. So that's where the expectations get really high on the offensive side. And uh, while he – while Gus Malzahn is an offensive coach, so he gets a little bit cushion when it comes to the defensive side, where we saw the true lack of adjustments last season. I think a couple seasons ago, you could argue a lot of the lack of adjustments were happening on offense, and yeah. that's on Gus Malzahn. But um, but but last season, we certainly saw the lack of adjustments on defense, and I think that cushion is going to start to wear thin when you when you kind of revamp the entire defensive staff. Um, you kind of get, you kind of utilize that recruiting uh, prowess that you have to kind of revamp the defense itself, uh, mm -hmm. along with your assistant coaches, of course, like Addison Williams that you were able to retain. But by the same token, it's like we need to see some better adjustments on both ends exactly. of the ball, and that, and that and that's that's the part that could be, um, uh, you know, it could be it could be something that could warm up his seat a little bit if we have a disappointing next uh, season next season. And that disappointing could mean eight and four, right? Like it could mean that. Um, I think losing a bowl game for third straight year could be could be a bad taste in the mouth. Like we don't want to have that. I think that so going like the frost and hypo years as good as as good as they were at least in the you know up until the end of the first year of hypo um like i would go into those seasons and we talk about it on nightline back in the day like i would say like even you know even after an undefeated season like my goal is still the same for the football team my expectations are to beat usf uh be in the conference championship game and and win our bowl game those are my three yeah. expectations for the season and i think that while we obviously don't play usf anymore which is which is a uh, you know is what it is um when i look at this schedule going into the fall um which is a gauntlet especially at the end of the schedule in my opinion you oh, have yeah. to go you have to go on the road to arizona state and then you have to go to west virginia I don't care how Utah. how good or bad West Virginia is, and then you have to play Utah to finish your season. Like that's a gauntlet. But I think beating Florida, competing for the for the conference championship, and then winning our bowl game. I think those are my three kind of like I would say goalposts for this season that I that I would look at if we can accomplish those three things. Which is I mean I just set expectations that are very high. Like don't don't yeah. uh, don't get me wrong, but. Uh, um, I feel like those are those are some expectations that you know honestly while it, while they're high they should be realistic and if we fall 
if we fall too short of that, then, 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 you know, I think that's next off season, that's when we start talking about that, but, but certainly not this season. No, uh, no, no. Yeah. We give him a lot of, a lot of leeway as he rightfully has earned in my opinion. Yep. Yeah. I, I agree hundred percent with that. I mean, I think Trey, you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, he underperformed for the amount of talent he had, especially at Auburn. Like they, these yep. were top 10 recruiting classes every single year when you go yep. look back. And yeah. Gus Malzahn in whatever it was, eight, nine years, or he only had two double digit win seasons the entire time. But on the flip side, he never finished worse. He never had a, a sub 500 record there. He was always a uh, worst case was seven wins. So it's like, he does enough, but you're right. He underperforms for the talent. I mean, to really, for, and, and, and his bowl record is it, when you include UCF is two and f- uh, three and uh, six. So it's not great or three and seven. I think I just counted. So, yeah. it, you know, he's not performed well there and he's underperformed talent, but for me, why he still has a lot of goodwill built and I'm okay with saying it, it is because of recruiting for me, because when you think of the, just on paper, how, UCF is recruited. It's always, it's never been like hugely exciting. We've always had maybe oh, yeah. one or two names that we get. And even after the 2017, 18 year, when we built up a ton of national goodwill, you look at those recruiting costs, they were still in the fifties. They were not high. Yeah. They weren't even oh, highest yeah. of all time for UCF at that time. So when you start talking about when we can get a top 30 class with mo- like eight, four star recruits, that is extremely exciting. Not to mention the transfers that he brings in all, a bunch of big names that to me even if it hasn't translated on field like major winning that's like has built up a ton of goodwill because that brings a whole new level of excitement we never had where you're looking at it like holy crap we just beat out georgia florida florida state for recruits we've never done that before to have one let alone eight four-star recruits that's just something that was has been unheard of until the last couple of years under malzahn and obviously it coincides with going into a bigger conference but there's no doubt about his recruiting chops and 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 for the on-field stuff, it is hard to be super mad about back-to-back nine-win seasons. Like, yes, he once again probably underperformed with the talent and we should have won the American outright. But like to sit there and be like, well, he went 18 and nine over two years. It's like, it's pretty good. I mean, there if you think historically, it's not like UCF until recently was always, you know, could say, hey, we won back-to-back. That was nine about what years. we would normally do. Yeah, but like, yeah, or like even, but even recently, you would think like until the last like decade, we weren't even getting to a bowl game every year. I mean, to now we've made eight straight. That that was something unheard of. So I agree, yeah. it, it was still underperforming. But like when you look at two nine win seasons, it's hard to be like, oh, that that's really crappy. But the expectations are higher than that. I hundred percent agree. So I don't think we're anywhere near the the Gus Malzahn is you know on the hot seat. But oh no, 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 yeah, no. I, I think I, the like I said, it's always been. It's a 12, it's 12 months from now. Like he's, I think you're right. Like again, battling what he's battled with injury to the quarterback all three years. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, he's all three years, multiple injuries. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like he's been in the the best situation because that's the most important position on the field. But like as some, that's why I said it was 12 months. I, I think again, to win nine games with a banged up quarterback, to win nine games with maybe guys who don't necessarily fit with what you have to win nine games with not really your players and still waiting on your guys to kind of develop, you earn that cachet. I'm just, I try to pro- provide the, the history of it because this is what we talk about. I think. even yeah. when we played, when we played Auburn, it was like, these guys are all five stars, but they don't even play like five stars. Like they don't now granted there were a couple like Derek Brown played like a five star. He was a, a freak show. Um, but like, it wasn't like like you look down the list of talent, 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 and this is the same talent that beat UGA that went to the national championship. This is the same talent that beat Alabama. We get on the field with them, and it's like, you know, like, and maybe that's just a bias that I'm seeing it from too. I oh, did we lose Trey? Uh, it looks like he froze he there. Freeze. Yeah, yeah, yeah Trey froze. froze. What I think what he's describing uh, that I was just going to chime in anyways is uh, is like we like punched. Auburn in the mouth that year and they couldn't handle it. Right. Uh, so you're, you're back now, Trey. I was just saying like, oh, yeah. like we want to see this team, like being able to be like, to like punch back after they got punched in the mouth. Yeah. Like, and we saw, exactly. and we saw like a few times this season, 
where like it seemed like the team was just like, you know what, we're just going to run it down your throat and you're not going to be able to stop it because you don't have the will to stop it. Exactly. And that's the part where you're just like, hold on, like we got talent, but like we but what are the what what is it about the coaching staff or whatever it may be that these players aren't buying into it? Or is it just is it just that, hey, these these are super talented players and they don't have the but they don't have the want to to like really bear down and, and, and punch back. And when they, and, when and they meet be, adversity and Ben, it, it, it really could be that like, right. They might just not respond to it. And, but if that's the case, they know better than we do. So if we can make that assessment that these guys don't respond, then you're recruiting the wrong, wrong kind of guys. Right. But I promise you the two star, three star guys who are getting it, you know, out of the mud, they respond because this is how we've always had to respond. Right. The four star, and I'm not trying to generalize it because there's plenty of four star, five stars who are dogs too. But history shows that those are the guys who are catered to more. They're not maybe not babied, but they they're spoiled a little bit more spoiled. Um, one thing I can always say, like about Coach O'Leary teams, we you can never punch us, and we're just gonna tap out. That was never our mo. No, that kind of carried over into those first early years of Frost too even coach Heupel because they were still a Le- we were still O'Leary guys. Um and I think that, like you said it trickles down into the program. Where that left, I don't know I don't know where cuz again I I was gone long gone. I don't know where that's left, but I feel like we've kind of lost that a little bit. Um just as a program and maybe that's just from you know being such an offensively driven fan base who loves to see points points points, we kind of lost that a little bit, but that's where like the frustration because even our offensive players like they were finesse guys but they didn't just let the defense run them over i, I talk point to that year before 2017 like all of 2016 we would dog the offense they would tap out and they wouldn't care and that but that was like o'leary style mantra but 2017 came they were punching us back you know and it was great battles but that's kind of set the standard for our offense yeah we put up points but they were physical too like and i see you see it a little bit with this offense so i, I don't know um, I think, like you said, I think it's the punchback, the want to be, you know, the strong minded kind of individuals. That's what we're kind of missing. So I hope we can. Well, I think it's that. just what you need to see. Right. Like I think yeah. the guys that we talked about, like that, we're excited to see what type of jump they're going to make this year, like John Walker and Caden yep. Call and like uh uh, I mean, you mentioned Nakai Martinez. Like, I think he's probably going to be like he has a potential to be a captain this year. I, I yeah. don't know him personally, but he just seems like the type of player. Like those three players that I just mentioned, and then among others that you guys would know uh, offhand better than me. But like, they just seem like there seems like those those types of talented guys do have that kind of leadership and dog mentality. That they're they're not that they're not that kind of prima donna or whatever you know you yeah. would think about it. So so maybe you know obviously we're we're not saying that they are uh one way or the other so we're just we're just looking and hoping to see that um yep. as they as they see them respond to adversity a little bit better than what we saw uh last season yeah cuz that, that's yeah. all it is with when you can't run the when when you're getting the ball i think what what game was it it might have been was it oklahoma texas tech i think where they just were like we're running the ball the rest of the game. Like I think oh, yeah. the last like 13, something like 14 plays snaps, in a row. yeah, some yeah, plays like they were. Was that running. Texas Tech? Who was it? It was the it was towards I, the end of the was season. Georgia right? Tech. It was Georgia, Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech. Game. That's what it was. Yeah, it like, was the bowl like, game. Yeah, like that's mentality. Like at some point, you can't wild. just say you're gonna let them run the ball down our throat, and there's nothing you're gonna do about it. Like that. That's that's what I that's that's the frustrating part. And I again, like you said, I hope. You know, a John Walker steps up. Even if they score one drive, you do it. You need to be snapping on people on the def- like on the sideline. I right. didn't see that at the games I was on. Like there has to be, I can't tell you how many times Jemias Pittman came to the sideline pissed off because of something. And sometimes it was stuff he did, and he would own up to it. But he was so mad at himself that everybody else would get mad. You know, Tristan Hill, Tony, uh, Tony, like Tony Garrard, everybody. Like that was a standard. Mike Hughes, even though he was a, a soft spoken guy, he would be mad. Like that was. That's defense. So, you know, yeah. I, I that's what I hope to see is just guys that care. Um, when things aren't going right, like we're gonna fix it, but you gotta go out there with that mentality. Go ahead, Alan. Sorry, I interrupted. No, no, yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. I I think I, it feels like when you talk about buy-in that it is there with Malzahn. All these guys seem really hyped up to play for him. The the guys coming in, even 
a lot of the current players talk pretty highly of him. Um, I think I just, that's where I think it's the, where he's underperformed with the talent. And I don't think it's like necessarily buying. I, I do think there are the silly mistakes that we saw multiple times last year, whether it was the end of the Oklahoma game, just bad coaching mistakes. And just, he hasn't uh, performed up to the talent levels that he's historically had for whatever reason, maybe there is some buying. I'm, I'm not inside the locker room. Maybe it, it just publicly, it doesn't seem like that, but yeah, it, it just seems that he's, maybe not maximizing the talent like we've seen past coaches at UCF do, whether it was like an O'Leary and, and O'Leary did it with even the higher three-star guys. I mean, it was, yes, we hear all the two story, uh, two star stories like a Bruce, you know, Miller or whatever, but um, you know, just with Malzahn, it, yeah, he, he does, it does feel like he's underperformed that talent. And this year, I, 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 I do think you will, the sentiment that you have, Trey, I, I do feel like it'll be permeated a lot more into the fan base. If we have a really underperforming year, because at this point we're getting a, a little antsy, right? We've had yeah. you know, three yeah. Uh, yeah. underwhelming yeah. years. We've lost two straight bowl games. We've blown major opportunities. Like when we were eight and two in 2022, and then we end up losing three of our last four. So we can't host the American athletic championship. We blow an opportunity to go to, uh, you know, the cotton bowl that year. Yep. A little antsy and, and, you know, that the, the, the fan base is going to want this. This feels like it needs to be a big year. Like I know it's only year two in, in the big 12, but it feels like it, it feels kind of like 10 wins are bustish. Like it, it does sort of feel that way. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. there'll be some crazy things that happen with injuries that we, we can blame or whatever, but you know, if we could get six wins last year with, and we have this type of jump in talent and all this stuff coming in, um, you know, like a one or two in improvement just doesn't feel like it's going to do much. And, and also the fact that Gus is in year four with, you know, what essentially three recruiting about to be four recruiting classes that are classes. on campus. Yeah. Of classes on campus, those guys got to start, you know, bearing fruit. Like, you know, obviously with the transfer portal, you do rely on a lot of transfers, but you know, and yes, he's had some guys that have already been big contributors like John Walker and, 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 you know, some of these guys that from the last couple of classes, but as a whole, we still haven't seen any of his classes become the leaders of the team yet. And Ben, you alluded to me, like Nakai mm -hmm. Martinez, and they're the only, that class, Nakai is the only one that are upper class right now. They're all juniors. But right. these guys, this is now you're going to have two classes that are either sophomore or junior. These guys got to start being the main contributors on the team yes. and, and not just transfers for the on paper to meet the field. And I think you could point to the last couple of years, oh, they're young, they're young, they're young. But now a lot of these high three-star, mm -hmm. low four-star guys are going to be the the main, you know, the 20, 21-year-olds on the team. That they got to be the engine. Yeah. So, um, and yes, I mean, you, you have even, these. Yeah, yeah you go, go you look at like that 2017 year. That was pretty much the engine guys, 2017, 18, were that McKenzie Milton class. They were sophomores. Sophomore juniors. Yeah. Sophomore juniors. Yeah. Gabe Davis and them were sophomores. Marlon, Hump, Marlon Williams, A.K., Gabe, Dedrick Snell, like Small all of the players. offensive guys were sophomores, juniors. Then you start getting the defensive guys. They come around. Obviously, it was a little bit longer. Mostly, they only didn't play because they just weren't physically ready. But talent-wise, Bam Moore, he was plenty ready. Richie Grant, they were ready. Antoine Collier, like a lot of those guys were sophomores, juniors. Like that's when you should be starting to come along, you know. And I think that's kind of what we're waiting on with this class kind of almost. It's like which class do we point to that's like, they're kind of carrying it, you know, and, and granted the transfer portal is different, um, yeah. but they should still be kind of the guy. Like when we look at the stat sheets and we look, watch the games, the primary the guys carry yeah. through that. Yeah. The team should be pretty much those guys with the transfers dropped in, like the Mike Hughes, the KJ Jefferson's should be dropped in. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and then you combine that with Texas and OU leaving the big 12s kind of wide open. You know, Wider. obviously there's some favorites, but as far as those overarching every year favorites that they were always, they're always going to be the preseason darlings. You know, it's kind of wide open for the taken, you know, and I think why not this year in year four, you know? So, I yeah, know. I think, I think what you're looking for is those guys that like from the player standpoint that were recruited out of high school and have been with the program to kind of set the tone and the culture for any new guy coming in, whether you're a transfer or an incoming freshman, you want 
you want the guys that are sophomores and especially juniors. And if you have any upperclassmen that have been with the program since they were freshmen, like to really just set that culture and introduce the new players. Um, I don't care if they're seniors incoming, you know, introduce the new players to how we do it here at UCF, right? How we do it here at, under Gus Malzahn. And that's, and so far in Gus Malzahn's tenure, and it's not his fault. It's just he's got it. He's got to plug holes with transfers, but those guys have been transfers. And um, I mean, I think unquestionably, probably the biggest leader on his first year's team was uh, Big Cat Bryant. Probably, I yeah. mean, just be, just because he had been with Malzahn, and so he was kind of that guy. He said, "Oh, this is how Gus Malzahn does everything," because. But it was Gus Malzahn at Auburn, right? Um, and so now we're looking for those guys that that uh, Gus recruited out of high school, and to set that tone and to set that culture because the 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 true like you know merit uh, from a culture standpoint um, within a team is is not necessarily set by uh, the coaching staff; it's set by the the leaders from a player standpoint, and so. Yep. That's what we. That's what we all are looking for this season. I think is a is a big is a big deal. Yeah, hundred percent. And and it's it's been you know really the last few years the the stat leaders for the most part obviously not at every position ha has been when you talk about Gus guys has been transfers which which right. is great obviously it's better to have great transfers compared to busts. I mean we've had a you know since Malzahn's been we've been we've had a ton dating back to his first year Isaiah Bowser up to, like you said, Big Cat Brian, up to up to now for guys last year that were leaders, whether it was JRP or or whomever, Kobe Hudson, Javon Baker. He's had some great transfers, which is a great thing. But at some point, you know, th there's still obviously a lot more high school players on the team than transfers, and you want these okay. guys that were all four stars and all these big names. And he's done a great job keeping all these Central Florida players, all these South Florida players in Florida at our school, which we've always wanted and we went away from when we had Hypo. Um, you want those guys to start showing like, okay, they're more than just on paper. And, and, you know, obviously you could take a pass. You could say they're, they're freshmen. Okay. They're not going to be, they're not going to, most of them aren't going to beat out upperclassmen transfers, things like that. Sophomore year, it starts, the pressure starts packing on, but junior year, I mean, at this point, if they're not, if they're not, at least most of these guys are a big portion. Of these guys aren't playing. I mean, then the class is kind of a bust. I mean, at, yeah. at some point, they're going to start recruiting to replace them. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and, and we're fortunate with some of the guys are, uh, you know, you have like the Nakai and Damari Henderson, John Walker and, and Randy mm -hmm. Pittman that are already starting to stand out. But I think overall the bulk is still transfers. So that'll be interesting because that's been like, we've all said his, his biggest thing has been the reason why he's built up all this cachet has been from the recruiting on paper. So, yeah, I think this is a big year in a lot of ways, the record, how, how we compete, the leaders, and then are, are these, recruits going to start showing that they're the next stars on the team. Yep. And I think we have a, a great shit schedule to show it. Cause again, like you said, we, we go to the big swamp. The, we go to Florida. You know, a lot of these guys are probably getting, recruited. Right. I mean, we're in year four, they're getting recruited by Florida. You know, um, we play Colorado with all the, you know, with Dion and his squad. We played right Tennessee. before Florida. That's going to be an yeah. emotional game right before we played yep. the most emotional game emotional that game. we've played in a long time. Like, in the recent, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, and, like I, I think that uh, Florida game. That's a heck know, of a stretch. Like, I can't even, I can't even begin to fathom like the magnitude of that game. Cause when we played them in that bowl game, like granted, they always use, you know, the excuse, oh, it didn't matter. We didn't care, blah, blah, blah. It was a big game, but. This matters. Like this is smack dab middle of the season. Both of our teams should be humming. Like this is one of our biggest matters. regular season games ever. I mean, I think yeah. I would argue, yeah, it's right up there, top five biggest yeah. regular season game ever. I mean, because yeah. it's it's at the swamp. Like you talk about the bowl game. The bowl game was neutral site over in Tampa. Like you know, the the season's over for both teams. You know, the they had high, injuries. Really. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's like, like this one is now, a real, yeah. real yeah, like, game. Think, it matters. I think these this is the kind of game like with the momentum we have just as a program, this could swing a lot of things, in my opinion. Like you win this game, even just convincingly, and just show like we have the better players, that changes how kids look at because Florida, you, we can honestly say they're not on the up like they're in a a little bit of a lull to where a breaking point because they've never really reached that Tim Tebow year. They haven't gotten back to that. 
you know, consistently, they've kind of dropped off with UGA and everybody else just overtaking them. They're at a point where I think we beat them. We kind of push into that, to me, the number one spot in the state because I think Florida – well, Florida State's come off a great year. But I, I think, like, we're starting to get to where it's – we're equals to them, you know, because we've never really been looked at it like that. We still aren't. But we start winning these games. We go on, on the road That's to the – Yeah, and yeah, we go the on the road into the swamp and win. That's – Huge, especially. For I don't. Florida. I don't think Billy Napier would survive the rest of the season, either. let alone he after wouldn't. that game. If we go into the swamp and beat them, I think I that's, well, that's an interesting point too. Because I was thinking, like, you know, this game could have so many a magnitude for a lot. Of, I mean, in theory, both teams could be four and zero going to the game. Yes, maybe right. Florida loses to Miami, but it's it's conceivable that Florida could be four and zero. We could be four and zero, and potentially and we'd both be ranked then, and both ranked. And if we go and and beat them. The, the magnitude of the win is for all the reasons Trey said. And then you're talking about, whoa, UCF is 5-0 and right now, probably top 15 after With being a win a at Florida. Team. Yeah, like, oh, my right. God. So, but and then, then we're going into the 12-team playoff. We're pushing playoff on Our resume. Like, yeah. yeah. And and then even if the game – it's funny. Even if, like, at that point, let's say we're undefeated, we're wherever 3-2, and two, and, and then let's say Florida is, you know, 3-2 and two or something like that, even if the game's not as big nationally relevant because both teams are, you know, maybe have one or two losses. But the other thing that kind of what Ben said, we we could actually be the team that gets Billy Napier fired. So I think right. in either scenario, you're talking about this game being magnitude. Now, I don't really, I don't even care what their records in that game. It, it feels like USF ish yeah. in the point where it's just, Hey, these are two teams that don't normally play. This is a huge, this is the first time that they played in the regular season as equals where the stakes are actually there. We're not like a tune up game for them. This is a real game yeah. with real stakes that, yeah, this could, this could, like, like we said, one of the, I think top, yeah, potentially top five game. Yeah. Uh, some and it it game. would feel like that in the sense, especially from their standpoint, it would feel like, like you were saying, Trey, like it would feel like we were starting to overtake them. Cause I honestly go, even going into this season and maybe it's just because of the turmoil that's happening in the ACC right now. Um, and, uh, and just their recent, not, you know, not a whole lot of success. It almost feels like UCF's on a, like either even or arguably higher than university of Miami at this point. Like we feel I, I like think- we're, we're like ahead of Miami. Like we've almost passed them up without even playing them, you know, yeah. in recent years. But like to do that to Florida, like to go into the swamp and beat Florida this season in twenty in this season of twenty twenty four, and the ramification, like the ripple effect that that could create, like all of a sudden people are going to be like, hold on, like we we know exactly. UCF's coming, but like not are like they, this. I mean, are we talking about them as being the like? kings of the state and i we're getting way ahead of ourselves but that 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 yeah i can't wait like that just that's going to be the magnitude would, of that would, game is insane i would give up so many games that i've played into like play in this game like, <laughs> oh, i bet i bet play in like this state right because like usf was a big game don't get me wrong but yeah but it was to go into the swamp yeah. at a point where you're kind of equals like I would, pay, oh my gosh, I'd give. What's well, crazy that we're even saying that too? It, it's it's funny because Seriously. like if if you if UCF and UF had a game ten years ago, let's say where we were going up to the swamp, even if we beat them, it would just be considered a crazy upset, and no one would really think about it again five years yeah. later. It would just go back to status quo, just be one of those crazy upsets that happen any given Saturday. But now you talk about beating them. First of all, it's crazy that we're calling ourselves equals, and secondly, we beat them. You you know, UF wants to win this game. They are just oh, as motivated, like probably there in the past. No like, excuses. They're if looking they at us. Oh, this game. There's no excuses. Right. They, they, they know they have to win. I mean, you're like Billy Napier could be paying for his job. I mean, we were talking about potential playoff jockeying here. Like this is a game that has ramifications for recruiting. So like UF, I think that this, this is a scary game for them. They have real things to yeah. lose as do we, but they really do, especially at home. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, you're, you're, I think they play UF. If I'm, they play FSU. They play Miami and us. Yeah. If they go 0-3 in that. I, I mean, I don't know, but if they were to go 0-3 in those span and that span, Billy Napier probably is getting fired. Like he's gonna get fired. Yeah. Like you can't be the fourth best team. Like that's not Florida. Like you're not the fourth best Florida school in the state. Like that he would get fired. And literally, it was proven out on the field in a single year. Like it wasn't just like people talking about it, fan talk. It was like yeah. you guys showed that you were the fourth best team. Yeah, in the like that was throughout the season. And, and that's like you said. They would never. 
I'll, I'll say this one last thing. Uh, and by the way, that's the first time I, anyone said that. So I'll, I guess I'll take that moniker. One last thing about this game that's funny is that I've I've always thought since this this was announced uh, that we were going to play UF that those those next two games we would never play. And I, I still agree. think that. But I if agree. we beat Florida in the swamp, there's no way in hell that the, the next two games are ever going to be played. Think that's they'll cancel they, they're never returning the favor. <laughs> I yeah, I, it, I, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, which is a shame because as much as this one game would matter, um, you'd you'd want to see them continue the series. I mean, it's like you know, regardless if they lose to Florida State ten years in a row, they're still going to play Florida State. And I know that rivalry yeah. runs extremely deep, but yeah, I, I I've always said I, I don't like, especially now. I get when it's G five versus P five, and they the Power Five team has too much to lose, and all this and that, and you know it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you, if you win, you expect to win. If you lose, you look like an idiot. But you know now that Florida or the UCF's in the Big Twelve, like I, I just don't. I think it's so much better for college football when in team states are playing, and you keep that regionality alive. Like I get. Yep in theory, why they would cancel the other two, but they should make this like a budding rivalry. I mean, if we're on equal terms and we're start getting to the playoff, like then, then you can say, Hey, look, that's strength. That's for the strength of schedule. We want to play them, you know, for strength of schedule, just like you see a lot of non-conference teams that are playing in the beginning of the year, like Texas and LSU have played a series, Florida state and Alabama, like all these schools. So it would, it would suck if they, if they ended up canceling, it. you know, the <laughs> SEC schools don't care about exactly, out of conference man. strength of schedule. They could care that, less. That's about exactly out of conference. They'll just they, gonna, they know they have, they have, it, they have it in conference. Bids. Yeah. They know they have their bids automatically. So, they're not going to hurt their – if they're going to hurt their chance to make the playoffs, it's going to be because, oh, we can't beat the SEC teams. But some I, of them think, are playing out of co- – like, look at – I mean, like, Texas and LSU have had a series the last couple of years, and, and the, that opening weekend, week zero, there's been some pretty big, from what I recall, like, SEC games. Like, uh, Texas and LSU is the only one I can think off the top of my head. But, well, Florida State um, LSU. I think, I think that LSU they – like, I think Texas yeah, and LSU. LSU yeah. I think Texas and LSU see themselves as equal. Like, there's an equal kind of respect. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Florida really just overall respects UCF. I don't think they, they ever will, to be honest no. with you. Oh, we got to beat them, I just, man. We they, yeah, beat them. I, think, I think we could beat them three times in a row. They're, they're going to try to – because, again, it means more. Like, that's what they're going to hold on to it. I, I just think – that's why they won't do it. That's why if we, they win, I think win or loss, they're canceling these next two games. They don't want to deal with – the ramifications that come with it. <laughs> Is it October 5th yet? My goodness. So that's oh going to be gosh, so much fun. I, I, gotta, <laughs> I gotta have, I can't wait. I gotta go. That's I'm going to that game. I think. And that happens. Say, that happens yeah, already, already. after we play, arguably, I guarantee you like one of the, one of the craziest home games that we've had in five years. Oh, I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, oh, Colorado coming to town is not going to be. That's a big gonna, game. It's not gonna be anything less than a, a than a crazy circus, is what it's gonna be. It's gonna be nuts. Yeah. So like that's okay. a week later, we gotta go in the swamp. I mean, this this schedule is not easy, man. <laughs> well, it, it's it's it is it, it's tough. It, it, it's funny. We we've talked about this schedule like I, I've heard media, and I think we've even talked about it a little bit. Talk about how like this schedule kind of lines up nicely for UCF um, in the fact like, okay, we have five conference home games this year versus yeah. four, like we did this past season. And, and, and some of our harder games we get at home, like, you know, Colorado and like Arizona and like Utah. But when you, when you look at how it kind of lines up like date wise, like, it's not easy. When you talk about the first conference game of the year is at TCU, which that shouldn't That's be cool. easy. Then, then you have Colorado, which is what we already mentioned, and then Florida. I mean, it, it's really not easy. And then you end that season with with Utah and West Virginia. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, this schedule to me feels tough. And I think one thing we're also discounting too, UCF entered a new conference last year. We're entering a new conference again this year. I mean, if you think right. about the teams that we're playing, there's, there's literally two teams from last year's schedule that are on this year's schedule. That's West Virginia <laughs> and Cincinnati. Every – New other team we in conference is brand new. So seven out of nine in conference opponents are Pac-12. Four of them are Pac-12 teams we've never played before ever. You know, outside of maybe back in the day, one or two of them, and then the yeah. other Big 12 opponents that we didn't play this year, like Iowa State and TCU and BYU. So this is to me is like you can't really even say, you know say oh we played them last year we know what to expect because every single team <laughs> is new. Yeah, and we have to go t- and we're going to Iowa State in October. Like 
I'm telling you that that one. That's year an I underrated Christ, game right there too, as far as matchup. Yeah, like those environments, man. It's it's so different as a Florida, like just being from Florida, going to those environments. It's so much different because it's gonna be cold enough. It's mid October there. It's gonna be cold. Oh, yeah. It, oh, yeah. Like and it's it's just it's different there, man. It's I can't wait. This is gonna it, be it's, insane. They go to well, Arizona that's State. Talk about like eight and like it, it, we. Talent wise, you're right. We should win most of these games, but like, yeah. I, it's so hard to. I could. If we go eight and four, like those. right, saying it right now, if we went eight and four, like I it's could see surprising. us going eight and four. Like yeah. if we went eight and four, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd be mad. Yeah, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, but like, and and that's where like again, that's the, kind of just the the hard thing. I'm gonna have to see how the eight and four looks because again, True. if you would have told Ben how the f- basketball team did this year before the year. You would have been like, oh, man, I'll take that in a heartbeat. But there were so many games, Ben, you were like, we should have won that. Like, we should have won that. I can't – like, and I think – Possession games. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we beat that to a dead horse there. So, um, (laughs) let's – we got a couple more things to talk about. Baseball, um, big news there. UCF baseball is finally ranked. Uh, They're top 25. I know one platform had them number 25. A different one had them as high as – 20 uh looks like number 20 from perfect game um so we are now finally a top 25 team um you know they're 18 and 7 now six and six in the conference i think uh you know they beat jacksonville six zero and they came back and beat texas tech in the three game series two to one so that's two straight big 12 series that they've won uh both two to one um and now they have bethune cookman next so they're kind of cooking right now, you know, top 25, getting respect in their in their first year in the Big 12, which we've mentioned is a, is a good baseball conference. And now we're right there in the thick of the race. We're top 25. Um, ben, anything you want to comment on the, on the baseball team's recent performance? Yeah, they had a big week. Um, Cade Boxrucker, uh, uh, one of our stud pitchers this year, uh, who's had a, he's just a great start to the season. He got a midweek start at Jacksonville, like you mentioned. We won six nothing, but he was he was one out away from a no hitter in that game. It was it was just a great performance, um, and uh, he just he couldn't quite. He kind of felt bad for him that he couldn't get the no hitter but he uh wound up with the shutout there and um and our bullpen has just been phenomenal all season our pitchers overall have been pretty good but our bullpen has just been phenomenal and um uh winning those games against texas tech on on uh what was actually thursday and friday since they uh, went thursday friday saturday this this past week because of easter and uh they won the two games against um, uh, Texas Tech to start the season a series and then they clinched the series. And then they unfortunately lost a one-run game on Saturday, which I was actually in attendance for. Uh, so that makes it two baseball games that I haven't seen us win uh, yet. I might, I might be turning into the Josh on the on the baseball <laughs> side. Um, I'm hoping that's not the case because I definitely want to catch a few more games in person this season. But um that that game they they tried to battle back um the bullpen wound up giving up one run at the very end of the game after um after uh i think it was uh dom castellano came in uh for the starting pitcher and and pitched a you know he really pitched well in relief and just got a little bit in trouble in the top of the ninth and uh and Kramer came in there and got it out, got him out. But uh, they only gave up one run, and that was the first run that they, the bullpen had given up in like six, seven games. So uh, the bullpen is really uh, playing uh, very well right now. The problem in the last game of the Texas Tech series is that we had two innings where we left, uh, we left bases loaded, um, you know, left left the runners stranded. And then we had one inning in between those two where we had two on um, and left the, both of those stranded. And, and timely hitting is just important in the game of baseball. And, and you got to be able to bring those guys in. And, and just, it just kind of bit us a little bit. Um, it would have been great to, to sweep Texas Tech, but um, we still got the series win. And, and we're moving. We're, we're moving as a baseball team. So I'm excited to see what those guys bring. And we'll, uh, we'll see what happens this week. Yeah. All right. Good update. Trey, anything there on baseball? Nope. I know. I just know softball. They were, they were losing every game in the last inning. They came back the first two and they couldn't do it the third, but it, it was exciting to watch. And they won that Texas Tech, the series too. 
Yeah. So yeah, baseball, um, you know, now 18 and seven, six and six in the conference, like I said, and they play Bethune next. So then quick update on other UCF sports is Trey alluded to uh, UCF softball. They did win the Texas tech series two to one. They played North Florida next uh, women's tennis beat Houston four to two, and they go up against Kansas state next. And then UCF men's tennis continued their really strong start. Uh, I guess no longer start. I mean, they're just a good team. Um, they beat number 25, Oklahoma state four to three, but then did come back, unfortunately lost to the sooner number 22, Oklahoma four to zero, but they're uh, only have three losses on the season. And I, I think some out, I don't know how tennis college tennis rankings work, but on the UCF site, it does show them as ranked. Um, I don't know which outlet that's through. So looks like they're breaking the top 25 in, in some form, way, shape or form and uh, looking pretty good. Um, other than that, that's pretty much our show uh, that we have today. Any parting shots, guys? I thought this was going to be a short show. <laughs> <laughs> did not turn in just, imagine if we had everyone on. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> We have another hour and a half to go. <laughs> it was cool that we were able to kind of get going on a certain topic. Yeah. So I thought we had some good topics to talk about. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. It was uh, for all those that's that are still listening uh, after two hours and fifteen minutes. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, y'all enjoyed it. <laughs> Definitely. Trey, anything? Any parting shots? Not much. Hopefully, we have the guys back uh, next week. So. Me, me and Ben won't talk as much next week when they're back. We'll, we'll just sprinkle <laughs> in a little bit and let, let Josh and uh, Roger make up on lost time. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that was our show today. Thanks for tuning in. And as always like subscribe and go nights. Go nights. <laughs> <laughs> we botched the ending. It's okay. <laughs>